Hello everyone, welcome to MAT, the Museum of Art, Architecture and Technology in Lisbon. This is Beatrice Leanza, I am the director of the museum. So you're joining us live today here in the space of the museum. Um, thank you for you know, uh, logging in. Um, this day-long event um, is planned to celebrate three incredible projects that we have now on show as part of our new spring season, which opened on April 5th and um, will be on view until September 6th, if you can uh, come and visit us in Lisbon. If you don't, please don't miss our wealth of multimedia contents, videos, materials, interviews with the designers, the curators, and all the contributors to the shows that we have on our website, and of course, the wealth of public program that we'll see all of the contributors to these three incredible projects, um, unfold in the coming, in the coming months, uh, and you can, you can actually enjoy both on-site and online, um, as well on our new digital platform, Math Extended, where a variety of new contents will be uploaded regularly uh, as um, further contributions uh, to these exhibitions. So before we start the day, uh, allow me a few words uh, be <clears throat> before we can actually sort of celebrate and champion the creative generosity of all the contributors to these shows, to these projects that uh, unfortunately could not, for the most part, uh, join us today live at the museum as we still live clearly in these precarious times. Because these are, in many parts of the world, extremely challenging times still. And we have passed through moments when we have feared for our communities, for those that we care for in kinship, in sentiment, or ideological affiliation. Plenty have been the efforts that institutions like ours have put forward to remain present in our everyday, continue to play a key role in sustaining social and creative dialogue, a sense of shared experience, and nurturing perspectives to help us collectively build through the present our common futures. So this is a vital mission that these times, our current times, are really prove more essential than ever, and one that at MAT we hope to further and foster. So a heartfelt message of support goes to all those institutions around the world that play a similar role, and to many of those whose existence is put under extreme pressure. So in this sense, I want to first and foremost acknowledge and thank the work of the entire team of this museum for their perseverance and resilience, as this is the energy and sense of belonging that allows this institution to remain active and offer a, public, a place of public gathering, intellectual encounter, and social debate. Thank you also to the EDP Foundation that keeps supporting our actions. So, let's enter into the day. Uh, today we are going to present two sessions um, with a break at 4.30 p.m. Lisbon time. Um, and you'll be witnessing a series of live and online events, on-site conversation, performances, and music. So the program features a number of protagonists from these three current projects, which together embody a desire for this museum to work with research-based and explorative agendas concerning our collective futures, tackling environmental, social, and geopolitical tenets that define our current era. In this forum of ideas, widely ranging propositions of practitioners in art, architecture, and design are being forward with scholarly and creative perspectives from different geographical positions and intellectual vantage points. So the projects that we are celebrating today are two exhibitions, namely X is not a small country, unraveling the post-global era, curated by Arik Chen with Martina Muzzi, and Aquaria, or the illusion of a box sea, curated by Angela Rui, which are accompanied by a large-scale interactive installations, a four-part journey that we commissioned and was developed by the research and interaction design studio, dot, 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 and is titled Earthbeats Sensing the Planetary. So, the first part of the day, right now, will open with the curator's round table, which is featuring Arik Chen, Martina Muzzi and Angela Rui, who are all joining us uh, online, live. And the conversation is moderated by Marcus Fairs, the founder and editor of the zine, who is also supporting this event today by streaming it on its own channel. So 
they all join us live. You'll see them soon. Um, fortunately, due to the current restrictions, we couldn't have them here. We hope to see them very soon. So, Marcus, take it away. Is this not? Of this exciting day. Um, it's a round table, although we don't know what shape the table is. We're here in the metaverse. It could be any t shape whatsoever. We have the three Thank curators you. that you mentioned of the two exhibitions. I'm just going to ask them to say hi one by one. So starting with Eric Chen. Hi, Eric. Eric. Hello. Hey, Marcus. Where are you at the moment, Eric? Uh, I am in Shanghai. Okay. And Martina Mutsi. Hi, Martina. I can't actually hear you, Martina. Have you got your microphone on? Yeah, hi, hi. And Just, where are you calling? Where are you calling from, Martina? Rotterdam. Rotterdam, okay, cool. And Angela Rui, finally. Hi, Marcos. Hello, I'm in Milan. Hi. You're in Milan. Okay, so yeah. we talk, we're here to your exhibition, Eric and uh, Martina, is about the post global world, but I think we're still very much in the global world right now. That's for sure. Um, I'm going to ask you one by one to talk about yourselves and the exhibitions that you've curated at Matt. I guess, Eric and Martinez, since you co-curated the talk, do you want to start off and, and share, the, share the task of talking about your exhibition? Yeah, sure. I mean, first, uh, maybe I, I can start off uh, probably uh, speaking on behalf of all of us uh, by first thanking Bea and the incredible team at Matt for really pulling uh, together three projects, two exhibitions and a project that would have been complicated to pull off uh, in normal times, but um, was uh, extraordinarily uh, difficult uh, to do. And uh, they did it with uh, with aplomb and uh, it all looks beautiful, at least uh, from the video, because uh, at least I haven't had, um, had a chance to see it yet. But um, yeah, so the, the exhibition that Martina and I worked on, uh, which is called X is Not a Small Country, Unraveling the Post-Global Era, um, is basically, um, uh, is, 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 uh, stems from an observation. I mean, Marcus, you said that we still are in a global world, and of course we are. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I think we've all watched as it has changed somehow, uh, certainly since the 2008 financial crisis and accelerating uh, in the past four or five years. Um, what that uh, is becoming, we're not really sure yet. It's still kind of happening as we speak. And when we don't know what something's becoming, even though we know it's changing, we've stuck the word post uh, in, in front of it. Um, so by post-global, we don't mean de-global uh, because we're not de-globalizing, but rather um, the globalization that we have all known since at least the 1990s with the establishment of the World Trade Organization, et cetera, et cetera, um, is definitely shifting uh, in uh, rather convoluted ways in which we see uh, different uh, systems of and, and uh, of, of logics uh, that are uh, overlapping, sometimes contradictory op and, and contradictory operating at the same time. Now, architecture design um, are things that uh, both manifest these uh, global or post-global processes, uh, while also uh while also having this ability to sort of articulate and make sense uh of of, of what's happening and so we invited uh nine uh, practitioners from art design and architecture to uh present um their projects some of them existing some of them uh newly commissioned some of them uh uh, new iterations of, uh, of, of, of of previous work, but all kind of reflecting at, at multiple scales and multiple time frames, uh, from the very immediate to the more speculative, and from different geographical vantage points, uh, the ways in which uh, the global is changing. Okay, and Martina, do you want to to add to that? Maybe you could also tell us about how the exhibition um, is 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 shown in in the Mac Museum. Like, what is it? How do you enter it? How do you flow through it? Tell us a little bit yeah. about the show itself. We, the exhibition is present within the oval space of the museum. And indeed, um, I would like to, to point out indeed that uh, somehow the final outcome represents also be the process that Arik and I developed along. So all the projects are developed in the months previous to the exhibition in communication. Then there are some which are reshaped or thought for exhibiting in, in this specific space and somehow um, let's say it represents a landscape so all the projects are in proximity to another and they are like contained within their own space but indeed they overlap 
from different points of view by entering the space. And this is really important for us in the same way how we somehow um, had individual talk and individual development with the participants in a way you, in this, this process is present like in, also in the final. It's a kind of plastic exhibition. There are different volumes within it from, uh, from projects that take really an architectural shape, project that creates more like a theater of everyday life, projects which are more sculptural and so more like represent the miniature, almost the visibility and the visibility of the materials, of the resources, some projects which are video-based in a way that represent uh, through the video um, as a medium potential scenarios or fl talking about flows and changes. And there are also projects which take technology and reconfigure technology as a tool to maybe um, research, even being far away, specific scenarios. So I think the, 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 um, the exhibition itself is this landscape of resources, flows, system, materials, and the way how they are placed within the space. We saw it before in the short videos. They communicate and they somehow stretch this fact of uh, simultaneously happening in different places, in different moments, but not necessarily communicating, but potentially be interlinked. That's a bit like um, um, the logic behind, uh, together with the beautiful work of Bureau, the exhibition designers, that uh, with a soft, soft but present touch, uh, they were able to, let's say, collect under, within the same space through the cross, which represents somehow a, a consideration or a research on the concept of, of the grid. This is actually um, maybe a few words, how the projects stand together in the same space they, as I said before, they occupy their own space, but they communicate within like creating this landscape, almost like a fictional geography in a way. And this fictional geography is uh, um, visually traced by a uh, review of uh, what is a grid and how, what, how we represent also geography on a map. So the grid disappears, what it stays are crossing points, which are a bit also part of the same idea of, um, of the curatorial um, statement, like how do we cross, where, that, where those crosses breaks, how these crosses intensify, especially in this moment. Yeah, sorry, if, uh, Mark, if, if, if I could just very, very quickly add a, a little bit, because the, you know this whole idea of, of the post-global and what we're and how we're trying to uh, show it is, is very abstract. Um, uh, just to be a little bit more uh, concrete about it, so basically, you know, we wanted the visitor to kind of uh, first experience uh, uh, work that, that, that had immediate resonance. So when you first enter the museum, uh, you walk past an installation by Wolfgang Tillmans of this of the series of uh, pro-EU posters that he began um, uh, putting out in the world uh, beginning with the uh, Brexit referendum in 2016. So this is something that, you know, our visitors can probably immediately sort of at least uh, uh, understand in some way. And as you go down but, uh, via the, the main ramp or the stair, uh, e either way, you're then, you're then immediately confronted with a recreation of the U.S.-Mexico border wall, uh, and in particular, the intervention in 2019 that uh, Ron Rael and Virginia Sanfratello did, where they inserted uh, these pink seesaws through the actual border wall um, uh, that allowed children on, on, and people on both sides uh, to, to play with each other. And, and, and then from there, it gets sort of uh, increasingly, uh, let's say, abstract and, and, and speculative. And um, the, the exhibition is called X is Not a Small Country. What does that title refer to? What does it mean? So it's borrowed from uh, a poster that is iconic in Portugal, though I, I didn't know about it uh, before, uh, by a guy named Enrique Galvao, who in 1934 designed this poster under the Estado Novo, which was the kind of far-right uh, nationalist government uh, in Portugal at the time. Um, and it's, it was just a fascinating visual. Uh, it's a map of Western Europe uh, with Portugal sort of highlighted in, in red um, and uh, Portugal's then colonies, uh, uh, you know, uh, Angola uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, Mozambique and so on and so forth. The maps of those countries superimposed 
on uh, Western Europe. And that's all under the headline, Portugal is not a small country. And this was uh, a manifestation of uh, an idea being promoted by the government at the time of pluricontinentalism, which um, my understanding of it is that it, it, it was the notion that Portugal was not just a mainland um, a European nation with far-flung uh, imperial colonies, but rather those colonies were integral parts of Portuguese sovereignty, so that Portugal was in fact a, a transcontinental uh, nation. So when you start when you start thinking, realizing also then that some of those colonial rela relationships nowadays uh, have been kind of somehow inverted, right? Uh, and we're thinking in particular of uh, uh, Angola, uh, the extent to which Portugal has uh, post-financial crisis has become uh, increasingly reliant on capital uh, coming from oil rich uh, Angola, and uh, also China, uh, the, the former relationship uh, there being uh, via Macau. Um, it, it, it seemed like a really in intriguing uh, starting point through um, through this sort of immediate uh, um, uh, 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 the, the sort of imposition of, of, of very sort of fuzzy notions of, of power and geographies uh, and how they shift uh, in looking back at them. Uh, that it, it, it seemed like a very good way to, to at least anchor the broader issues that we're looking at now with the show to where the show is originating. And, and we're hoping that it'll, it'll uh, prompt some uh, discussions in, in, in Lisbon. Okay, and finally, before we go over to Angela, how did this uh, exhibition come about? Did, did Beatrice, did the museum say, guys, come up with an idea for a show? Or was it, did it fit into an agenda that the, 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 the museum was keen to explore? And then also, how did you create a, uh, an exhibition, ironically, about the post-global world without presumably being able to spend a long time in Lisbon putting it together? Well, your first question, um, you know, was it part of a, a larger, a broader uh, museum agenda? I'm sure it was. And actually, my first visit to Lisbon, um, you know, Bayash had laid out on this glass wall all, all, you know, all, all, all her plans and, and rubrics and, 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 and so on and so forth for the museum. And I don't remember any of it. <laughs> but um, but uh, within that, uh, somehow she um, uh, she invited us to come up with something, and w it was when I was first in Lisbon that um, this idea uh, came up. And I think the fact that uh, you're right, you know, we, we're doing this show in Lisbon, but we're doing it remotely is just another kind of way of thinking about uh, the post-global, right? I mean, it's global, but kind of not at the same time. And Martina, the the exhibition is a, is an unraveling of the post-global world, which is a kind of an interesting word because um, unraveling has negative connotations in, 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 in British English of things like falling apart. Does the, does the show have any conclusions? Does it lead the viewer to taking a certain takeaway about the post-global world or is it designed to trigger questions, discussions, multiple solutions, multiple takes? I like to say that uh, each project might have conclusions or not. That's also why each project, which is all, most, most of them are based on research. And then sometimes they finalize a portrait of their research with a really precise idea. But at the same time, together, those, the, the projects one next to another, the, I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. I think Eric, we, we never <laughs> thought about it, but I don't think about that it gives a solution or one direction. Um, I don't even think it's the point of uh, necessarily the point of curating. I think that curating as a practice becomes more interesting if the message can be somehow composed by the visitor um, in a way that ex passing through the different scales and the different territories that the project themselves cross or the one that they somehow invent, uh, arriving in it's like a climax towards the uh, imagining the future. Um, I think that there is not a final message. There are multi messages as much as the choice of the designers also was, or designers and architect was. It's like, how actually can you uh, give many directions possible and how they can coexist under the same landscape? Um, I think that um, I, I really, it's really important to understand also the backstage of the project. Now we don't have time, but there is the much extended website and also the publication where we also develop like more interviews exactly for this reason. 
um, that the, that exhibition is not only the the end place. It's of course a place to visit and to learn, but uh, potentially the projects are not even finished. Some of them are even ongoing researches and ongoing projects. So it's more like um, a presentation uh, specific for the for the space and for the moment. I would imagine that some of them would be growing in the next months, or maybe if they were done a year ago they would look different so I don't think we we aim at all for final um, message I would say it's more like the message that some issues are important some resources has to be observed how they navigate some objects that we live every day they need to be understood where they come from uh, where they go afterwards but it's more like uh, it's more um, maybe being aware of the transition and knowing and so like my push to to get out of our, our home again with uh, with the research of those those disciplines like design and architecture and technology how it can somehow be mediate, mediate of being a tool for it okay great thanks very much angela let's go to you now if you could tell us a little bit about yourself first of all and then about aquaria the exhibition that you've curated at matt all right Thank you, Marcos. Yeah, I, I'm Angela Rui. Basically, I'm a design curator and an educator. I'm teaching at the Design Academy in Dovan at the Geo Design Master and uh, at NABA here in Milan. And um, well, if we um, maybe I take like 20 seconds to thank everyone who participated to this show. I'm here alone, but I have not been alone during this process. So a big thank to Bea and to the full team and to all participants who very, you know, very much um, participated with um, with joy to the project. And and then especially thank to 2050 Plus, Valdo Pestellini, Massimo Tenan, Guglielmo, uh, Campeggi, and Obelo who designed the visual identity. I mean, I, and also Martina Motta and Marta Jeco who collaborated to the research <coughs> uh, that is in show uh, with almost 100 document, documents that comes from the archives. So this is, I really feel that this is a co collaborative project. And, um, and the exhibition itself uh, basically looks at how uh, the oceans and the seas entered our, um, our cities, uh, basically, and our homes and cultural institutions. So, and how also it question, the exhibition questions how um, we have interiorized the notion of an ocean kingdom. So to me, it was very important to look at the, at the way culturally um, we translated um, the notion of the sea, the notion of, or the knowledge about the ocean uh, through a specific object and space, which is the aquarium. Okay, so a very basic, simple uh, object uh, that more than other objects embodies that divide between uh, nature and culture. And it does, it does so through Again, a very simple mechanism, which is the glass wall. And that glass wall um, separate and connect us at the same time. And after, you know, we were working at this exhibition uh, during the, this year. So basically from our own uh, fishbowl existence, so from our home. And also the idea of this exhibition then changed once um, all of us started to, to perceive the world through a screen, right? And that screen really... Uh, became to me the paradigm um, to work on the way we um, we look at the sea, but also, I mean, uh, at the matter of perception. So basically, it's it's really an exhibition which is taking into account the way we perceive um, um, the ocean and, and also the legacy of culture um, that is very related with, you know, um, facts that happened 150 years ago at the sea. So um, to go through a little bit um, through the whole exhibition, so there is uh, for us <clears throat> um, precise, not precise, uh, quite free path that we decided to, um, to follow. And um, basically the exhibition, it is organized uh, from the microscopic scale to the transoceanic one. So there was like, uh, you know, we start from a zoom in and then we zoom out and we really try to go out of that. Uh, object or that uh, you know fictional space as the aquarium is for example and the and the path unfolds through 11 works that offer um, specific points of view to reveal aspects 
that generally remains shut off for our vision or even our imagination. So um, we start from a first, you know, chamber that contains four works. We start with a work uh, which is Reclaiming Vision from Mario Lindikman and Toril Johannesson, who decided to film an entire journey through the microscope. So what you see there, it's like a revelation of a word that you can't see through your naked eye. So basically it's a way of also presenting a marine word that normally is not, you know, it's so um, visible uh, to, to us as a species. Okay. And then um, the other works start to contextualize the animal in the ephemeral distinction between subject and object through narrative of oppression or, you know, emancipation. And we go on, uh, you know, enlarging the scale and taking uh, the idea of the aquarium as a staging machine. So we have the film of Armin Linke. We are lucky enough to see the presentation after our talk later, um, which is completely filmed in the, back, in the background um, of the oceanarium there. And it is a big commission of this exhibition, basically. But also the theater in the work of John Jonas um, as a way of um, rethinking or the theater as a door uh, for interspecies alliances. So still that, you know, um, space for uh, imagination and, uh, and so on and so on. And then we enlarge again the scale and we start to speculate about the, the, the state of the present or the form of the future. Um, again, presenting two very different works, the film by uh, uh, Michela Di Mattei, was entirely filmed inside the uh, Dubai Mall, where you have the fourth biggest aquarium in the world, and where she compares the um, she compares basically the tanks, so the fish tanks and uh, the window displays, you know, as both spaces of desire, of power and control. And we have then the work of, of Superflex then that is taking into account, you know, climate crisis and a possible sea level rise as a condition um, that we can take into account when we envision and design infrastructure for uh, that moment that we will arrive, that, 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 that will arrive. That means with the pink elements, they um, kind of design a sort of infrastructure and that infrastructure that are like, um, seen, can be perceived as, as the foundations of our future cities are also thought as a possible, you know, object or infrastructure that can host marine species. So, so that separation between the terrestrial or the human domain and the marine one is completely um, cancelled. And then, uh, well, and then we go uh, through the works and we finish um, this path with the work of a composer, basically, where uh, the work asks the visitor to really engage uh, with the condition of being inside the water. And as a spectator, you have to really dive with your head inside the tank to, to hear the work of Steph Dewis, who translated something from data taken from sentinels and uh, satellites you know, um, um, looking at the movement of cots in the North Atlantic, um, these data are converted and translated into music for strings. But the only way of perceiving it is to really put yourself in a no terracentric dimension. So it means that you have to dive and and keep your breath and, and then maybe you're allowed to do that. So it, there is a path. You start from this iteration of, of the screen as you know, as the um, as the main format, everything is bidimensional. Almost everything is bidimensional in our exhibition. To then finish um, the path, becoming a fish, it's you, yourself. So you end up as a fish. Yeah. <laughs> and and where does if you could explain if you if you enter the museum in Lisbon, um, where how do you get to your exhibition and how does it relate spatially to the one that Eric 
and Martina have curated. Because so, the exhibition, if, if people don't know it, that sorry, the museum is this kind of big swooping, amazing swooping structure by Amanda Levitt, which is right on the waterfront. And the, the dominant spectacle visually when you go in is this big oval kind of atrium. Yeah. Sure. But, um, which Eric and Martina's exhibition is in. So where's, where's yours then in relation to that? So when you enter the, the main oval gallery, then you cross that. So I really like also this idea of Beatrice, of not having hierarchies or very fixed, you know, separation between galleries or different spaces of the museum itself. So you really swim um, from an exhibition and through the others. And there is a lot of proximity also um, from, you know, um, one exhibition and the other so you have to cross the, the main oval and then you take your your left and you and you will see <laughs> and you will see the work of Simon Danny with a sequence of screens and television and of course immediately you understand that that there is uh, the beginning of our exhibition which is uh, which is occupying the main uh, gallery which is a very strange space honestly uh, because it's like uh, to enter a body of a uh, of a whale or a body of a fish and basically you also have connection with the out with the outside because there are some windows and um, we also enjoy the fact that light can enter the space even if we have a lot of film so we needed also to find solutions you know to have a very uh, mixed space where you are all the time inside or outside swimming you know from a tank to another and then re-emerging by using the uh, natural light that is entering the museum in that precise space and um and well and then when you finish you immediately are again inside the exhibition of of Arik and martina so i really like that um sort of yeah no separation at all and as as curators i think we all um found it also challenging at the beginning but but also very nice at the end of this process you have to put yourself in the condition of you know not pretend that your exhibition is uh, ha needs its own real space of separation and isolation from the rest of the contents so you can literally swim between the two exhibitions like yes, a, like a like definitely a fish. yes and it's mm -hmm. ironic talking about an exhibition which is about aquariums or fish tanks when all of us are basically in our own little fish tanks of our screens here. Exactly. Um, but what are the, this is a question, open question to, to all of you. Uh, what are the similarities um, and the, the kind of coincidences and the synergies between the two different exhibitions? In, in some ways, do they tackle similar themes? Do they include similar um, bodies of work? Will the visitor, um, be be shocked when they move from one to the other what how do these two um different presentations hang together or do they have things in common or is there nothing at all that they share and i'm, I'm going to see who wants to answer that question otherwise i'll choose someone i'll start oh uh, angela sorry go no, ahead no i go 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 ahead please <laughs> well, <laughs> well, maybe flat. i'll start because i i'm um <clears throat> I'm, I'm more easily excused because I have not actually seen both exhibitions. <laughs> uh, uh, so so uh, maybe there's a, there's a little bit of leeway um, uh, for my response. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the similarities is, is really um, to be found in the name of today's talks, right? Uh, open, closed, because both, both, I mean, both shows deal with sort of ideas of territories and, 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 and demarcations and so on, but also uh, importantly, uh, uh, the, the kind of mutability of those demarcations, you know, the, um, and the fact that um, uh, 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 the, the line between open and closed and, 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 and the fluctuations b between openness and closedness are kind of changing all the time. Good, okay. Yeah. Um, about right. <laughs> <laughs> As a start. Angela and Martina, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, Martina, would you like to take it from here or do I go? You go, you go. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, there are two, um, two things that maybe we have in common. One is about like the way we try to, um, to work with the content we have. And, and the other one is about the, the format and the, and the register of artists and designers involved, the use of storytelling and so on. So from you know, my perspective, what we try to do is 
to really use that object as an entry point to make visible some, you know, threads that that are, you know, like linked to the modern idea of living outside of nature. But so we started from, from the aquarium, but then it becomes, as an object, it becomes, you know, an open system if you read it as a litmus test um, through which you make visible a series of wider connections and entanglements, but for example, with colonial histories or histories of displacement or domination or just when you look at industrial culture um, and excitement for technology um, as a mean of emancipation you know no matter what it costs so um, in our exhibition there is this counterpart which is more visible through all the historical material that we wanted to combine with the contemporary works you know uh, where we try and really um um, to really underline these paths that are totally connected with the initial moment of globalization of the world, which is totally linked, you know, with the uh, great international sonographic uh, expeditions, with mil military ship ships that has been converted um, into ex uh, with the and for extraction purposes, or you know, transoceanic missions for. Um, the laying down of, of telegraphic cable that, you know, um, would effectively change the space-time characteristics of the global communication forever. So you can see that there are like links, maybe, um, you know, we, we took it from an historical perspective to then understand what, what the works in show. But I see parallels uh, between the the start of modernity, or what we call like modernity, and also all the um, you know all the things that you discuss in terms of post globalization in a way. Sorry, yeah. I would also say that the um, the proximity of the two exhibitions, but also the third exhibition, actually as a as a visitor, it works really nice because it's almost a climax. And how, while our, the exhibition with Eric, uh, it's a, as I said, it presents like this micro world of uh, mm. <laughs> micro views in a way, but micro world. So they are like uh, um, one project after another, after another, and they're really independent. And then entering in the aquatic exhibition, which is just like a large scale independent world of its own. And then going back out, especially after becoming a fish in exhibition of Angela at the end, you enter in the, in the planet city of Liam Young, where you become another identity through the costumes of the, of the, of the film itself, which are also part of the show. So I think um, this, um, mm. it works really well, uh, especially, and uh, the navigation also. It was also surprising for me, but uh, it was really beautiful. Yeah, sure. And, and if I can just add one thing, a um, very simple one is about, again, the storytelling as a method, you know, as a method of, um, or a way of being together, a way to create past and future, make them visible in a way, uh, to narrate things happening at different scales. Again, you know, sometimes hard to be perceived otherwise. So... Well, maybe we can we can do the next exhibition together, no? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I have to ask this question. In, in this post-global world, in I, I was going to say post-pandemic world, but we're still in the pandemic, so it's not post-pandemic yet. What is the relevance of physical museums? What is the relevance of physical exhibitions? How does it impact the role of, of curators like yourselves? Again, open to all of you, otherwise I'll choose someone. I think it's still a relevant place, the place of the museum, uh, mostly for also um, a place for different communities to come together in a physical space. Um, and I think it's uh, a challenge for the, for the practice of um, how the digital and the physical can coexist and learn from each other. And not necessarily the digital being a, um, a way of surviving, but mostly a way of rethinking, inventing. 
So not only how the physical can be translated digitally, but how, how the digital language can inspire back the physical and how they two can learn from one another. It's about language, it's about semiotics, it's about presence, it's about, um, it's mostly about communication also. And I think the museum still has a fundamental role um, in our cities. I mean, it's, in terms of uh, a place for things to exist temporarily or permanently in a form and take new messages by in the way how they are interlinked each other, you know, it's like curating is creating narratives, not necessarily closed narratives, but even open narratives. I would, I would preserve that together with an understanding, a deeper understanding of what are the potential, the potential of the digital space itself, but not use the digital as a translation of the physical. I mean, that's some, something that for me is really important to, um, to stretch. And maybe if I could rephrase the question slightly for, for Arik and Angela, if, if there were no more museums in the world ever again, <laughs> Could you still curate experiences, exhibitions, and provocations as successfully in a different way? <laughs> you know, I I always ask these. You know, the, 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 there are a lot of things uh, that that oftentimes you know you you start to question their relevance and uh, and what what always sort of reassures me of their relevance when they are still relevant. Uh, is when I ask, can you imagine a world without them, right? Like, let's say conferences. I have to say, I, I'm not a conference kind of person, right? <laughs> um, uh, it, it, they, they seem like places where nothing ever really gets gets done. Um, but imagine a world without them, right? Uh, and, and, and sort of the uh, all, all the sort of uh, conversations and dialogues and, and, and ideas and, 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 and interactions that that would not happen. Uh, I would just apply that to the to your question about the museum. You know, like obviously uh, museums and institutions in general are going uh, through uh, a time of, well, immediate crisis due, due to the pandemic. Um, but also I think uh, there was a longer term crisis uh, that's still in play about what their role and relevance uh, is, who, who, uh, what stories they tell, what audiences they, they serve and, and so on and so forth. Um, these are questions that are being addressed to, uh, with very, to, in, to, to, varying, to varying degrees by different institutions. Uh, they'll all have to find their own answers, but fundamentally, um, I think the museum and the museum space um, is, uh, is, is in increasingly critical in this post-global uh, context, right? I mean, speaking of open and closed, uh, museums are are, 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 are are among the really um, uh, uh, irrefutable nodes in keeping things open, the open flow of ideas, uh, people, culture, etc. at a time when there are more and more forces trying to close them. Uh, and, and, and maybe I'm, I'm especially, um, I, I, I feel this viscerally as an American who's been living in China <laughs> for, for the past few years, uh, uh, you, you, you see um, these, um, uh, uh, you see these, these relationships changing in ways that um, uh, are, are in, in, in ways in which uh, you know we there has there, there there have been hints that we're sort of going towards a new sort of cold war or, or back to the old paradigms of great power conflicts and so on and so forth. Culture is uh, at the minimum and through museums. Um, not something that's going to save the world, as someone recently sort of uh, retorted to me when I when we were talking about this very subject. But uh, it is something that can at least hold the remaining threads together, so that they don't all snap, right? And uh, and, and and museums are anchor points uh, for keeping these threads uh, together, while uh, governments decide not to get along in so many other ways. Angela, have you got anything to say? Yeah, I, I I'm very agree with what I heard from uh, Martina and, and Eric. I don't know. I really feel like a dinosaur when I think about, <laughs> yeah, honestly. A dinosaur, I did really, you say? Dinos yes. I mean, <laughs> I really still um, prefer <laughs> actual places, real places, real museums, real exhibitions. When I say real, I just physical, I would say. And I'm not saying that the digital, you know, um, doesn't have this power of you know creating new ways of gathering of sharing of 
of discussing and la 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 la. But at the same time, um, you know, to me, museums still are um, a safe space for, you know, um, for example, for sharing ideas or um, to meet other people, to discuss in person, uh, to discover materials um, by yourself and not because you are found by an algorithm that is proposing you stuff. You know what I mean? So it's that like it's about the choice, deciding of going in that precise place because you take the time, you know, for yourself or for your ecosystem, uh, which is your family, uh, and um, and then and then afterwards, you know, you you take the time also to discuss upon that. It's something that you live differently and it remains differently um, within you, within your memory. And also, I have to say that um, I really love to include some, most of the time materials that come from other, you know, from histories. And, you know, a lot of materials are still not digitalized. So in the moment in which you don't take the time to go to other institution to, you, you know, to meet people, to find those materials that no one care about, it means that that material, which is also a, a trace of as our society, you know, our past and then the way culture has been built in time, it just become immediately invisible. It doesn't exist anymore. So, well, of course, everything can, you know, be done in the way we are doing that. At the same time, um, I'm still one of those enthusiastic person who really like to have people to stay with people, to uh, spend time with people, also when I do projects, you know, so I really like this collective way of, of, of meeting up and uh, um, and basically, I mean, after a year like this, with museum closed around, I feel and on, not only, I, I'm speaking for also for all the friends with whom I'm sharing this idea all the time, very banal ones, but just to say that we're all depressed by the thing that we don't, even if you, you are spending your time on Zoom calls or having this beautiful conversation together with special people all around the world, um, at the same time, you really miss that time of going somewhere, which is your, you know, time is really like the most precious thing we have at the moment, right? And so to not be able to decide how to spend it uh, or, or to change the medium, you know, um, that you want to use um, to spend your time, then, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, probably I will change my profession. Yes, I will not be a curator anymore. <laughs> so, so your, your answer is, I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're actually out of time, but I'm going to paraphrase and ask you to very quickly answer one of the questions that's popped up on my screen. Um, and to, in order to lift the mood a little bit after your your slightly violin-y answer there, Angela. Okay, it, we're in the post-global world, the post-pandemic world, give us, give me one positive about it, all of you really, really quickly. It can be a one-word answer if you want. Let's start with you, Angela. There's all that bad stuff, but on the other hand. Um, sure, I mean, um, I think we're re-evaluating also the way we spend our time, right? So for example, we know now that if someone invites you to the other side of the world to just have a moment, you know, as, as this one, uh, you, you just say, but we can do it online, which is fine. So something we learn about that, which is fine. At the same time, completely different, uh, you know, topic. But to me, this pandemic has been um, very useful also to understand what this exhibition was about. And uh, so this idea of understanding, uh, you know, or at least to work with this idea of the filter, the ontological question came from the ontological question that we are all facing today, right? Um, from which we experience the world like behind a glass or through a glass or through a screen. So to me, it was really a sort of mechanism to um, deconstruct also the hierarchy of um, this sort of relation we have among us and among other beings, um, other than human beings. Mm -hmm. Eric, one positive of the post-global, one day post-pandemic world. Well, I mean, for, for the post-global world now, the one positive is no jet lag. And I guess for the post-pandemic <laughs> world, 
uh, a positive will be jet lag again because we can all see each other in real life. Great. And Martina? I would like to say accessibility, which is indeed a bit before thinking how the museum will disappear. I think the museum have a lot of work. And the first one is how it will actually be accessible more for a larger group and not only through object, but maybe also to physical indeed. This is like uh, the problem with the contemporary museum and contemporary, I mean, old historical and contemporary archives still have. That's, I hope we, we learn what it does it mean to not be accessible in the West. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, thank you all very, very much. Time to hand back to Beatrice in, in Lisbon. I'm sorry we couldn't be there with you in real life, Beatrice, but um, we'll do it some other time for sure. Thank you all very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello, welcome back. Yes, we all hope to see you very soon and that we can sort of restore a certain kind of a little bit more of a human practice um, to all these dialogues. So, we are entering into second part of this first part, uh, in fact, uh, of the day. Um, I have to say also that you all, uh, the curators now on this uh, conversation really, um, you know, made an excellent job of, of describing things uh, without really showing any visual. Um, I hope, well, I am biased and partial on it, but um, I hope that you all, you know, um, felt inspired by their words and, and feeling like discovering more through these um, incredible projects. So, uh, in this next moment of the day, we are going to present two um, special um, pieces uh, by two of the artists present in each of the exhibition. So we are going to first um, feature a special digital performance realized by Ibia Camp uh, as connected, developed in connection uh, to her work in X is not a small country. Uh, her piece in the show is an augmented reality installation that relates to the depletion of both natural and social ecosystems in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria and connected that has been confronted with an environmental catastrophe since the 1950s uh, following the arrival of multinational petroleum corporations. Uh, so, uh, EBS um, created a new piece, a special piece for today, uh, titled After the Dust Settles, Comprised Particles, um, that was um, realized by converting imagery she received on WhatsApp from her family in Nigeria, uh, which she has been living away from, of course, due to um, COVID-19. So, in this performance, she's taking us through a constructed digital space, confronting the effects of oil extraction in the Niger Delta, and uh, using game physics, partial systems, and point cloud data sets, EBS speculates on the future of the region. Um, the performance will be then followed instead by a lecture, a presentation uh, by Armin Linke, whose new film, newly commissioned film titled Oceanarium, is um, part of Aquaria, the exhibition Aquaria. And um, Armin will introduce uh, a little bit, you know, like the research and, and uh, it's the connection of the piece uh, to his, you know, previous, previous works and his, um, his artistic, you know, exploration uh, and will, you know, reveal somehow how the systems of entangled technological, architectural and human orchestration in living this complex machine, which is the Lisbon Oceanarium. So the film was uh, realized entirely in the backstage of the Lisbon Oceanarium in the fall of 2020. Um, and Armin's lecture will be then followed by live Q&A with the curator Angela Rui, who will also take a few questions from the public um, as soon as they finish. So sit back and enjoy the performance of Ibie and the talk by Armin.
particles in the air take a certain amount of time to settle. They spin, they travel. With an increase in temperature, particles move faster as they gain kinetic energy. When they settle, they are in a new condition. A particle system is a technique in game physics, motion graphics and computer graphics. It is used to make a simulation that appears to process a chemical reaction. When writing about post-globalisation, I mainly think about my connection to Nigeria, being British Nigerian and living in the UK. One of the striking realities of Nigeria is the devastating effect on what globalisation has had on the state and economy in the oil sector. Crude oil was deemed as Nigeria's black gold and the first discovery of oil was made by British Dutch petroleum company Shell in 1956. There is a lot of documentation of how multinational corporations have laid bare unprotected oil pipelines across the landscape and you can see the disregard for the property of citizens from these photographs. This shows a lack of investment and protection to the landscape the lack of precaution of the infrastructure with its failed welds and flimsy structures has led to spills and explosions which have contaminated the land. Researchers describe these as purposeful leaks. It's almost a way that multinational corporations can control the landscape and the people that live in the neighbouring areas. Shell is just one of the actors in this violence. Since 2011, Shell has reported 1,010 spills, with 110,535 barrels and 17.5 million litres of oil lost. However, the companies often underestimate the real amount. The pressures of globalisation significantly influence the operations in the oil sector. This has stripped the Niger Delta of sovereignty. A place once rich with biodiversity has been devastated by the unattainable practice of oil and gas extraction. This has shifted how the landscape is governed and new formations of farming and caring for citizens have now emerged. In 2020, the production of oil extraction reduced and oil prices collapsed following a reduction of oil demand during the pandemic. In unravelling the post-global age, there is an environmental condition that people in the Niger Delta now remain in. Decades of explosions of gas flaring, contaminated rivers, Obstruction in the agriculture and fishing has harmed the health of residents. The landscape is covered in thick black soot. This is a reminder of the industry that has disrupted the delta. It is an everyday reality for the communities. The black soot on the soles of people's feet and hands is almost an imprint on their bodies. As a Nigerian living in the diaspora, 
You experience the changes in Nigeria through imagery shared on social media from family. The internet is arguably the most visible aspect of globalization. It has remained a driving force for information and relations. Through Google Earth, I found myself scrolling through images of the Niger Delta. From the billboards displayed are aerial imagery. One is an aerial view of an aging petroleum facility where crude oil spillage has spread out into a mangrove swamp. The glistening rivers is the aftermath of the massive oil spill. Zooming in at the aerial imagery, I start to reconstruct the landscape with multiple sources. The view of the Google Earth is the beginning of this map of reconstruction. The map is also informed by social media platforms or a family shared photographs and YouTube channels. This is a way of drafting new cosmos and to reconstruct narratives. The photographs are formatted in point clouds, a data set that represents space. They are groups of particles that can be assigned as point sources in the same way a particle simulation can be. What is interesting about point clouds is that the points represent a 3D space. However, there is also an absence as it only shows the external surface of the 3D shape. Many point cloud studies can resemble a vague indication and trace of a space. This allows the identities of the space to remain anonymous. Using this tool of mapping, I imagine new realities. This transforms into backdrops of Pentecostal billboard advertisements, which I saw while traveling through Port Harcourt. Flashes of the soles and palms of people's stained black hands. Studies of periwinkle shells taken from a sample in Bugama. The photographs gathered from WhatsApp, Facebook, Calabari TV and YouTube, auntie shop with multiple fabrics being sold, Calabari masquerade. All of these moments merge into a world where people can take control of their narratives. Calabari TV is a Calabari TV station designed to inform various parts of the community and people of the Calabari kingdom all over the world. The overlays of the imagery, the YouTube news reports and Calabari TV are all almost an extension of the vibrant Notlywood film industry. With all of these narratives, it's almost impossible to separate social and cultural conditions from environmental ones. The environment that the bodies contend in are material comprising particles, gases, pressures, contaminations and different types of matter. The new formations of care which I've been looking at are particularly by the Calabari periwinkle pickers, fishing industry and market traders. The coastal communities are the ones affected mostly by the oil vandalism. There has been a huge amount of unemployment, especially in the younger generations. The periwinkle pickers are mainly women 
and are described as the mothers of the village. They wet profusely when the tide is low to collect the periwinkles. In a canoe, they then transport the collected seafood to roast on land. This is then traded in the local markets. I see that growth can happen from the periwinkles. Walking through Bugama, you could see periwinkles all over the landscape. The periwinkles were even used as an extra texture and support in the cement in the buildings. When walking through the compounds of Bogoma city in early 2020, I could see heaps of periwinkle shells that belonged to one family. These periwinkle shells would form various revenues of business even after they are eaten. The shells would be sold to builders, road constructors, and used in other projects in demand for creating more materials to build from. In speculating on the future of the Niger Delta and the production of work and trade, the periwinkle is a symbol of community. Two cups of periwinkles, one cup of sliced oziza leaf, it's one kilogram of meat, two medium sized dry fish, cocoa yam, 300 milliliters of palm oil, three seasoning cubes, one cup of ground crayfish, salt and pepper. Two spoonfuls of ofu. This is the ingredients to enjoy river soup. It can be supported by a side of gari and some star beer. Hello, I'm Armin Linke and uh, I would like to show you some images from my archive to react to the um, work that we filmed for the exhibition Aquaria. It's called Oceanario and it's filmed at the Oceanarium Aquarium in uh, Lisbon uh, last September. And, uh, I worked with uh, Giulia Bruno 
for the filming and uh, Giuseppe Elasi also for the editing and the sound. And we tried, together with the team of the Oceanario, to look at the structure itself, but look also backstage, to look at it uh, a little bit like a theater or like an opera house. So in its uh, three-dimensionality. Um, and to, to really see what's happening uh, inside. And um, maybe now I, I will mix up the images from the film with, with other images to uh, react uh, as if you would already have seen the film that maybe, but in fact, maybe you didn't. Uh, anyhow, I also didn't want to, to bring too much images to you so that you still might be interested to look at it. Here we change completely uh, space. This is a picture taken about uh, 20 years ago at Star City in Moscow. And we see uh, the rehearsals for astronauts uh, as they um, rehearse how to move in, uh, in space uh, without gravity. That is something that uh, basically, it's also an aquarium, but it's an aquarium that, uh, that works a little bit like uh, an experimental space. It, it's a mimic, it's a theater for the outer space and water here is used um, for something else, to, to create a model. Because in fact you could say that the, mo the, the aquarium is a model of a climatic space uh, and um, exactly like the astronauts has its own uh, dress that is a little bit his let's say, climatic aquarium. Of course, he's human, so he needs, he needs oxygen. Uh, the, 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 the aquarium for fishes is a recreation of, of a climate space, exactly like, basically, a spaceship uh, uh, out in Earth that recreates the atmosphere for a specific human being. So we, we wanted to show the aquarium as a... Uh, in the part that you don't see normally, that is the backstage, that is the, uh, the, the director's room in a certain way. And here we are again in, 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 the, in, the, in this picture, you see the control room of the whole Lisbon Aquarium. It's a computer by a German company, Siemens, and it controls in real time all the different parameters. So temperature, salinity, uh, and, and much more pressure uh, and in a, in a certain way it's the model of our uh, also of, of how uh, delicate is our whole earth climate system how much this uh, small temperature changement of 1.5 degrees uh, could be really important uh, here we see some of the first thermometers from the Galilei uh, museum in, in Florence as a, as a reaction. Um, they are also transparent. And they are also a system of, of control of, of climate. And in a certain way, we could say that the aquarium is then the model of the whole ocean. It's also a kind of climatic model in the sense that, uh, yeah, as I already said, uh, the whole team must be very careful not to change the parameters because uh, if these parameters would change, the whole system would uh, collapse. And here we change completely uh, place and topic. We are in Texas at a supercomputer center that uh, where scientists try to calculate the flow of the ocean and the different uh, temperature and the system of the oceans. So um, again, trying to model the ocean, but in this uh, sense, uh, trying to compress it into uh, in smaller parameters so that it can be uh, calculated by a computer. So uh, here you see it's too complicated to, to feed the computer with um, all the parameters of just one ocean. Uh, so the computer model split it up or say the scientists split it up the five different oceans to feed it into the algorithms. And that's quite interesting because in the uh, I had to think that uh, in in the aquarium in, in Lisbon, in fact, the whole theater is constructed by five uh, uh, different uh, climate parts. So there is the center basin, 
and then there is uh, uh, the um, the cold basin there is the uh, warm basin exactly like the different uh, parts pacific uh, antarctic arctic uh, and uh, that we have here uh, in this model so you see the computer uh, must recombine them uh, on the different uh, parts um, and here we have then another supercomputer in Hamburg that's the climate computer where all the climate uh, history of, of the world is so that it can be fed then to, to, the, to the parameters of the computer and also I had to think about other spaces like here we are in the south of Spain uh, in El Ejido and that's a greenhouse where again you need an enclosure uh, you, you need to, to create an artificial space so that tomato can grow uh, faster. So you need again technology and uh, maybe it's not so different uh, from, yeah, fr from the workers that uh, work in the aquarium and that have a specific routines with specific rhythms uh, through the whole week and also through the whole year. Um, and of course the aquarium is also a viewing machine so it's very connected really to the to the idea of cinema maybe you could say it's a kind of uh, proto cinema as you have a screen that in this case now in our days is an acrylic uh, wall we had also uh, an interview with uh, peter chermayev that explained us that is the designer and architect of the um, uh, of the scenario in in, uh, in lisbon how the invention of the acrylic wall allowed in a certain way to uh, to to look through the walls and also to withstand the incredible pressure of water uh, that um, a, a large basin like this must uh, um, uh, must resist uh, and yeah i had again to to think and react to other images that i had in my archive relating to another film project that i did on the perception and of the alpine landscape and maybe it's also interesting that uh, yeah the the, um, the first structures of the aquariums uh, uh, are invented around 1850 exactly at the same time when the first railroads were constructed in the mountains in a certain way uh, the railroad created a kind of uh, moving cinema the people were transported through the landscape exactly like uh, like you are transported with a film camera through the landscape and the um, here we see uh, a window uh, in the tunnel constructed to go on top of the Jungfrau Joch. Uh, but also, yeah, the Alps uh, get to be uh, a kind of uh, model of the whole earth or a model that brings different uh, climate, different seasons. Here we are at the Segantini Museum in St. Moritz. So a Segantini, a painter, uh, they tried to construct a rune gemelle of the ex in the expo of 19... 1898 uh, and these are these paintings are the model for this uh, Rundgemälde exactly like the um, Oceanarium uh, in Lisbon that was constructed during the expo so it was part of a world ex exhibition uh, so the idea that you would compress all these different climates all these different image uh, animals from all over the world and bring them together uh, in in five different climatic uh, tanks. So a kind of I would say uh, bubble uh, bubble tower of uh, biological languages or bubble tower of biological um, uh, living species and also a kind of cartography. So the the the, the aquarium is also a little. Uh, globe theater exactly like the globe theaters built in 1850 and it's also cartography of all the oceans uh, of the earth uh, here um, another picture from another project and this is the the famous uh, card of fra bartolomeo uh, drawn in 1450 
to transport the goods uh, through the different uh, oceans, exactly like now the fishes are transported through the different oceans to come to the uh, uh, aquarium. And uh, each fish uh, needs uh, also its own food. Uh, it's uh, own, so there is a specific kitchen that uh, prepares a menu for each typology of fish, depending on his, uh, yeah, on, on his characteristic and original um, ambient. So, uh, again, the, 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 the aquarium that, that we try to film is in fact uh, uh, very interesting to film because it's a machine, uh, it's a machine to depict uh, uh, the different dimension of what normally we humans cannot see because under pressure, uh, under the water there is such a strong uh, pressure. Uh, here, um, one of the first drawing uh, of pressure, pressure and deep uh, me measurement uh, uh, by Luigi Ferdinando Barsili uh, in 1681. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the, the, the aquarium is a machine to show to the public what normally is for the human body is not possible to see because the pressures are so strong uh, underwater. Our bodies would be uh, crushed. And uh, so, uh, because if we would really to take pictures or uh, let's say images from the deep of the sea are not easy to take, you need specific uh, technologies. Here are some uh, sketchbooks uh, from different uh, technology developments that I photographed at Woods Hole uh, Institute for another project called um, Prospecting uh, Ocean. Uh, so the aquarium is also uh, part of this history of underwater uh, depiction, uh, of depiction of geology and depiction of um, biological resources, two typology of resources. Here we see uh, the drawings of uh, Darwin uh, from one of the first um, travels where uh, the different space, spaces were tried to, to be um, catalogued and, uh, and prepared for, in a certain way, also for exploitation. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the actual way to go deeper into, into the water at this time would be well, go to aquarium or uh, take a ROV, that is a remote operated vehicle uh, that enters the dark uh, ocean and with uh, artificial lights and the cameras and other sensors like sonars uh, tries to send images. So the, the, the aquarium is a, is a way to, uh, to look in, in a space that normally is absolutely inaccessible uh, to human beings. And uh, it's just a way to look at uh, the species that are there, also the microbiological species. Here we see the first, um, uh, one of the first microscopes, again from the Galilei Museum in Florence. Or here the team of the, of the scenario in Lisbon, looking at the and of the variety of uh, biological spaces that are also grown there. Um, so uh, the, the aquarium is not only uh, a place where you have a collection, but you also create a collection, like here uh, in this laboratory. Uh, or, for example, you can, uh, or here where, where coral is growing, Growing, grown, and uh, also divided to um, um, uh, to create more simply more biological mass. And what is also interesting that then these uh, different species uh, are cataloged, and also of course Excel is the uh, is the main instrument uh, of catalogation. And of course, they have also an economic value, and also they are exchanged through we are different uh, we are software with different aquariums around the world. So all the aquariums, are, all the zoos of the world, use a very similar um, software or the same software. So they can exchange their 
their living goods uh, exactly like in uh, this other picture that uh, is taken in a, a bank in Paris where you see the one of the central desk uh, of uh, uh, exchange um, yeah this is uh, a little bit um, a, a reaction to the film that I would like also to show you but uh, um, maybe it would be good that you come to the exhibition to to see it in its uh, let's say materiality and also in its sound because we also try to work really uh, on the sound landscape and not only uh, let's say on the visual landscape that the uh, uh, that the aquarium is. Thank you very much. Hello? Could you hear us? Hello. Hello, Armin. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. So I think we can uh, start our conversation. Hopefully um, they will hear us, but actually I'm super happy to have this you know, honor to start the conversation with you about uh, the film that we produced uh, together with the help of Matt. And um, it has been a beautiful journey. And thank you very much also for this lecture that uh, actually um, it's very um, brand new for me as well. So thank you a lot. You brought us, uh, you know, through amazing places. So starting from the um, Lisbon Oceanarium, we went through the star city in Russia, uh, we went to the Alps and then Texas and then Babel's Tower, narratives and representation, Galilei Museums, uh, the cartography of Fra Bartolomeos, um, and the first attempt to depict the ocean as a, you know, as a global space for transactions as well. And all these images I have make me think at least that refer to environments, um, places, architectures, instruments through which in time humans modeled um, a particular and simplified um, way of looking at, especially at non-human environments. So to test them in a way uh, like hostile environments, not as the life systems, as well as to find new systems or simplify one or models as you um, presented to understand and build knowledge um, around the climate crisis or the idea of these changing parameters that can um, you know, create the chaos, as you mentioned before. So let's um, maybe start from the first question. So if I look back at your work um, in general, it often focuses on the observation of archives and documentary practices to make visible the entangled realities and systemic contradiction of the Anthropocene. But this is also the first time that you observe like a living, living system, a living archive, okay. So um, it's also called the collection, no? that is a term that is normally used for other sort of institutions like art museums or institutions that normally we, um, we, we, we um, kind of, you know, um, walk through at least. And um, so what did it mean to observe such a detailed uh, control of an environment that has been designed to host um, and observe not only the humans, but, you know, in, in, in difficult, in kind of difficult, um, situation or again uh, testing other systems but instead uh, um, designed for other or more than human species like fish what was the difference um, in the way you observed such a you know place uh, yeah so <laughs> first of all uh, yeah th this was also the question when we began to film is from where we should film and of course uh, my first idea was Okay, can we can we put a camera inside the water? Uh, but of course, this was not possible because we would have uh, disturbed the fish 
on a certain way or dis disturb the living living being uh, there uh, and of course there is also issue of contamination um, because you could bring i mean we are now under covid but <laughs> the, the the questions of contaminations in aquarium are the most important ones because you have a lot of mass of a, a huge quantity or a critical mass of of ling being on a on a short on a small space so the issues of contaminations are are very critical and also the contamination between human being and uh, uh and animals uh, because you could transfer also uh, melodies which is also very actual topic and there it's really an everyday topic not only a, a topic of of the last year so uh we understood immediately in, in a in a in a dialogue with with the with the team of of the aquarium that it was not not possible to put anything in the water because we would enter another territory and uh, that that would be the backstage or would be the stage and and so this differentiation was even more uh, clear because the, the question was okay how can we film from the point of view of the fishes but basically there is <laughs> there is no way uh, or they would i mean not not in the conditions in which we we, we filmed and uh, yeah i i had to to think about now also about the question and in fact maybe we we we, we filmed in other places for example in in seed banks uh, uh, for example, in a seed bank uh, for a project um, for Anthropocene Observatory, we, we filmed a seed bank in, in Bangladesh where, for example, um, farmers reconstructed, reconstructed 15,000 typology of uh, rice plants that are not more in use because, let's say, other industrial uh, seeds are used that can resist better climate. So, in a certain way, there uh, these are still biological life. You could say these are still living beings that are there in this in these pots, and they are also cultural goods because they each uh, rice typology has a a use or can react to specific um, conditions or has a, is used for a specific cuisine. But it's completely different again from 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 animals from fishes. These are these are plants, and there is a plant in, in its potential status. Um, yeah. So and then on the other side, you have other uh, yeah other living beings that are the humans, <laughs> humans that are taking care of of uh, of the fishes, and then there are the other humans that is the public um so it, it's an interaction of these uh, of these um, three typologies and then there are other um, um other living beings uh, that uh for example the algae that needs to be under control because if not they would uh, take over uh, let's say uh, the stage so uh, there is a kind of negotiation between uh, these different typologies of human beings all right thank you and what is the role of architecture in all this? So you have met Peter Chemayev. Uh, there was a beautiful interview uh, you met with him and Julia uh, Bruno, and it is part of the exhibition as well and of your work. So he, we know no, that he is the star architect of aquariums um, worldwide, I would say. And um, I'm just curious if uh, from the conversation with Peter, for example, um, some new ways of looking at this sort of close words, maybe clarified also your mind on the way, um, you know, or what these places represent today. Um, yeah, what, what was interesting for me wh while I was preparing also for the interview is, is to learn that uh, Peter Chermayev also uh, started as a filmmaker, as a documentary filmmaker, so that somehow uh, the aquarium as an idea is really very connected to to the idea of, of cinema uh, so because you you have the screen and and inside the screen uh, you have you have basically a three-dimensional space but still you look at somehow two-dimensionally because uh, because this acrylic screen is is um, is is in the end uh yeah two-dimensional how how to how you see it because also 
uh, water has another way to fraction light. So when you look into <laughs> into this volume, you you don't have this normal stereoscopic view that you we have as as humans because we we look like with another lens also. Basically, the whole aquarium is a lens. Yeah. So on one side, uh, this idea that uh, yeah that it was um, it's very connected with with cinema, and so it's curious that uh, that Peter Chermayev that that designed from the sixties, uh, yeah, many aquariums around the world started exactly from there, or also his uh, one of his very first projects, I think, at the Montreal Expo, uh, the the American Pavilion, that was built very three-dimensionally and somehow um yeah also the idea of of a world exhibition uh so that you you find again uh um again also in lisbon because the aquarium is part of uh of um Mm, a, a real estate development plan it, it's it's kind of that that was part of uh, yeah to the transformation uh, of uh, industrial part of of of, uh, of lisbon into uh, mm, uh, into also housing and, and a new area so yeah this 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 interconnection of of in fact also urban planning of a whole city that that is connected together with the aquarium. And this is also something that we discussed also uh, together. And I learned also from, a bit from, <laughs> from your research when, when, we, when we prepared for the filming. And maybe uh, the last thing was also that was quite interesting. I found uh, looking at the very first drawings uh, of, of uh, Peter Chermayev, the, this idea that entering the, um, with, with this bridge. First of all, the, the aquarium is also almost like a ship. It's a kind of arc of Noé because it's kind of an island in, in a port. So you enter through a bridge. It's also a, a moment of initiation. You leave land and enter a new space. Uh, and the idea was also to, in the first plan, to have a, a sequence of, of video screens, almost like a yeah, conceptual uh, video art installation. So again, this, this interconnection with um, yeah, the, the, the let's say that the, the aquariums are part of a, of a tradition of multimedia art or of totally. land art. Yeah, and yeah. and it's 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 not only architecture. It's 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 involving really a kind of it's really a kind of Wagnerian idea exactly. of uh, <laughs> Gesamtkunstwerk. Yeah. Would you like to explain a little bit what how you look at the um, at the oceanarium as a baroque? theatre machine you always mention that but it's very clear to you and i uh, but maybe <laughs> less for the audience so maybe if you can briefly uh, make us understand why this comparison with the that sort of model yeah so sp speaking about um Lisbon, the the whole aquarium has five different um scenes that are five recent basins so it's interesting that you have exactly the five x construction like uh, uh in the opera or in, in theater uh with the um, yeah uh, uh and and also you have exactly like in theater an upper part uh that where let's say all the fishes get feeded so all all the inputs are coming there and also all the light is coming there exactly like in theater but you have really rails like in theater from which things are brought down and also you have uh, uh yeah like um shakespeare ariels you have all these scuba divers entering into into the into the the the, the, the basin and uh, if you're the viewer you have these angels coming up are uh, coming down that are in fact uh, uh, used a little bit as a choreography for the public, as a special highlight, let's say, in the in the day's program, and um, yeah, and then of course you have uh, the issues of of sound. So you, there is exactly. no sound from the public, but you have loudspeakers. So there there is a there is a mm, like, colonna yeah. sonora. <laughs> yeah, a very interesting like, part of your work is also the sound, right? I remember very well at the beginning, You basically it is also part of this comparison with the opera 
uh, theater um, that you were talking about. But at the same time, I remember very well that from the beginning, you were talking about the importance of, of the sound in the film. And so you um, kept yourself and, and Julia with all, you know, the hydrophones to record um, on the tanks. And, um, and you refer um, very often to the piece of Jacques Tati, the playtime film, you know, uh, talking about this yes. kind of inversion of the sound between inside, outside, upwards, downwards, and so on. And how then, how was it at the end um, when you took all these recordings and just gave it to Giuseppe Yelazi, who is your sound designer and, and work on the sound? Yeah, so, well, of course, before we, we, we started the filming, one reference was the, the film of Jack Tati, Playtime, that is, in fact, also a great film because it, it's about uh, modernism. It's a kind of grotesque <laughs> uh, depiction of the modernist city, of the modernist uh, idea. And uh, by the way, it was the, the, the um, Jack Tati went bankrupt by doing it because he wanted to film it in 70 millimeter. So the maximum technical, I mean, he was, let's say, speaking about modernism, using the most high technological equipment that was at that time, but also he, he kind of uh, played with, with the sound. So you have a view from the street into the glass modernistic building of, uh, uh, that basically was, is a, is a kind of what you see is basically something like the fence in, in Paris, but you look into, well, you are inside the building and you hear the outside and you are outside and here into the building. So a kind of reverse uh, action. And anyhow, yeah, we, we were aware that we wanted to, to, to work with the sound. And then, but when we edit with Giuseppe and Giulia, we always try to edit without sound. So we, then we, we, we try to keep the rhythm like we would work with uh, dancers on choreography. So we don't use the sound and then so we edited the whole film with that sound and then brought the sound back. And then uh, we had a moment of depression because we, what we heard, we, we took so much care in, in recording and what we heard was, was always pumps, like uh, And so then, yeah, we, we, we were allowed to, to put our hydrophones, especially in the lab, in little tanks where algae are produced algae that then are and and that are then feed to the um, to specific fishes and so yeah the the, the most of the, of the sound comes from this uh, bubbling of of the laboratory and also but also this is mixed up with the the sound um, the sound that you can hear in the in the spaces that mostly is this typical whale uh, sound or it's also kind of a genre, I would say, that is connected to the to the romantic uh, sound idea of uh, of the ocean. So, uh, yeah, basically, the, at the end, the, most of the sound is is almost re re reconstructed, like a fully uh, a fully work. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think we are running out of time, and we now move. Uh, um, to the questions that we received from the public. And so I will read you, um, Armin, some questions, all right? So Thank the you. first, yeah, the first one, sorry, I'm losing my earphone, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so question one, great talk. In the curator's talk, Martina reinforced the idea of accessibility in times of pandemic. I am curious to hear Armin's opinion as a filmmaker on the question of accessibility. Yeah, so uh, now that's, um, I, I don't know how, I mean, you could speak from very much, very different uh, point uh, of access, accessibility. I mean, uh, First of all, of the most of the fish that are not allowed to go back to the, to the oceans, I would say the most important one, because in the end it's a zoo. Uh, a second one is, um, yeah, of course, also accessibility of filming. So, mm. I mean, how to construct uh, a relation of uh, of trust when when you film in a in a such uh, critical environment. Uh, 
for example, yeah, the, the fact that, uh, uh, for, uh, yeah, that, for example, the whole team of, of the of the aquarium in Lisbon really takes the, its its work very seriously, and they are really you understand they are really there the full priority to take care about uh, the fishes, and so in a certain way, whatever you do is under the um, uh, under specific um, okay, uh, um, process procedures, yeah. And, and so your your filming also needs to be negotiated uh, how it can fit into these procedures and and not disturb them. So accessibility is is part of something you you need also to negotiate in a, in a project like this. And of course, it was also double complicated to to film during uh, during COVID time. So uh, yeah. I, I, First of all, I'm quite happy and I'm quite thankful to everybody that made this possible in this period. Uh, and then, yeah, we could then generally speak about accessibility of uh, of of institutions. But then now, I, I don't know if this this would be um, yeah a bit complicated because I think you would need to 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 speak from a specific point of view. Mm. Sure. Uh, yeah, accessibility also linked to the collaboration we um, uh, we we had with the ocean area. I have to say that was very precious to have, you know, to have the the right to access the backstage of the oceanarium itself, because it's normally um, a place that uh, people cannot visit, and it costs also a lot of negotiation, uh, you know, from Matt and uh, to the oceanarium and vice versa. So I think it's also you know, very important to mention that uh, accessibility is also part of the negotiation between uh, institutions that really move towards um, say the same uh, gaze or the same goals, I would say. And how do we discuss um, ecology today, eh? even uh, considering, you know, the platforms and urban platforms from which, from which we speak. Okay, let's, let's move with the question two. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. Does the film destroy or reinvent the illusion that is kept alive by the aquarium? Mm, well, I don't know. Uh, maybe it tries to show um, the tools or the technology or the, the knowledge or the culture that is uh, constructing the, the illusion in a certain way um, because we are yeah we, we are trying to um, we were we were trying to uh, basically to to film on each uh, layer of, of the museum including the the, the lower part uh, for example where you there is a scene where you see how salt is transported by a little uh, cart and and then at a certain moment I read on this um, uh, salt um, container that it would come from the Red Sea. Uh, so, of course, then you you immediately say, okay, this place is again interconnected ge geopolitical, and in a certain way, so we 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 tried also to show this part that. Uh, normally you don't show because it's uh, that way destroying the illusion. Uh, but on the other side, uh, I think this is really, um, um, yeah, really, really interesting. And um, or uh, yeah, also we tried in a certain way to film also parts that normally would be considered boring. Because in a certain way, the, the aquarium is also uh, a magic place because you can see what uh, what we as humans, as we cannot live in water because we cannot breathe, but also because the pressure is too high. So we, we cannot be there. So um, I got a bit lost now in my... <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> but we can, we can uh, exactly, yeah. let's move to the last questions and yeah. then we have to close. Yeah. And I think it's very related with the, the second one. So it says, Armin, how does this project relate to your previous prospecting, prospecting ocean project beside the obvious relation with the sea and sea life? 
yeah, I, I had to think that maybe more than to prospecting ocean, also if we are speaking about oceans, it would, uh, as, I, as I tried maybe to, to explain um, also in this pre-recorded lecture, maybe it would fit in, in more into this, um, the Alpi film somehow, because basically it's about um, looking how a landscape is constructed and uh, a landscape that normally would not be accessible because you could say that the Alps is also an, an invention um, um, of the same period of urbanization uh, and, and, and technology. So to, to bring a landscape that normally to the urban citizens would not be near, so and to, to spectacularize it through, through technology, of course, on another scale. But uh, yeah, it it may be a project on 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 cultural landscapes in a certain way, or on uh, on which we project uh, um, um, issues of our society in a certain way, because the the, the the fishes then get to be a kind of proxies, emotional proxies uh, of uh, of the issues of of uh, of of we as human beings. And they are used in a certain way as as strange emotion, emotional proxies. Yeah, maybe it's something that came to my mind now. Maybe that would be nice to discuss. Oh, further. we should take notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we can continue. <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, let me see if um, you know if from from Matt uh, they give us uh, the right timing. But I think we are we are we're done actually uh, because in five minutes another performance will start. So Armin, thank you very much for this amazing discussion. And um, and you are all invited to go to visit the exhibition where also you can find the, the film of Armin. Um, Armin work in collaboration with Giulia, Bruno and Giuseppe Yelasi. I like to mention that because they are really part of, of this gang and we had beautiful collaboration <laughs> and beautiful conversations all together. And so, um, thank you again, and I pass the mic to Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Armin. It's, it's wonderful um, to hear you speak of this. We wish, you know, we could keep you here online for longer. Um, but, um, of course, I echo Angela in inviting all of you to come and see the show and enjoy uh, Armin's film, which is 40 minutes. It's, it's really a voyage, so you should, you know, take your time and soak it in. Um, but, you know, we have to move on our um, next bit for the first part of this, uh, of this afternoon of uh, uh, celebration of these projects. And so, in this last part before the break, we are going to focus on the third uh, project that we are that is part of our um, you know, spring program here in Matt, uh, and it is um, the project we commissioned and that was developed by um, Studio Dot Dot Dot, based in Milan, um, an installation uh, titled Earth Beats Sensing the Planetary. So. Dot 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 is a studio multi multidisciplinary ensemble of uh, creators that range in, from fields of architectural, vi architecture, visual and interaction design, coding and storytelling, uh, who has for now almost 20 years focused research and development on the creation of new and innovative ways for humans to interact with the world in a continuum between physical and digital space. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a background on this on this project because uh, we really started this uh, collaboration with the, with the designers already in the fall of 2019, um, and this uh, as a foundational effort. Uh, for us uh, at the museum to produce content and knowledge, um, knowledge tools uh, around the core tenets of environmental degradation and the ongoing quest to its repair and the prevention of its further uh, escalation. So this installation 
is a uh, data-driven, fully interactive journey in four parts, uh, which focuses on unpacking the complexity of, of climate science uh, by letting users um, familiarize with and, and quite literally compute uh, the effect or the impact of their individual or collective actions against the global carbon footprint um, and to compare that or to confront that with uh, industrial practices, consumerism trends against global warming uh, predictions envisioned by different policy scenarios. So uh, this um, interaction uh, uh, and this journey is made possible by a quite incredible piece of technology that the designers have developed, coded um, and programmed, which is dubbed the CO2 mixer. The CO2 mixer is quite literally a console. So um, you will see after this introduction of mine a little video that will give you a sneak peek into the museum and so uh, to give you a sense of what we are talking about. But it's quite literally a console which visitors can interact with and use by mixing data um, just as if they were a DJ at, at a DJ deck. Um, so the project really looks at the environmental crisis as first and foremost a, a human crisis. So of our unresolved relationship with nature and the dilapidating effects that anthropic actions pose to <clears throat> the preservation of biodiversity and so in general to other than human forms of life. Uh, this project, uh, so that it's been now in the making for you know, a year and a half, was developed in close collaboration with the European Space Agency uh, and its Copernicus program of, uh, called, of Sentinels, which are in fact satellites that circumvent the Earth to monitor environmental phenomena, um, as well as with the International Energy Agency and the support of EDP innovation and EDP uh, sustainability. Um, so in this last bit, before we break for one hour, we are gonna have two interventions. The first is, uh, first we're gonna hear from Alessandro Masterdotti, who is the co-founder and CTO, and CTO of Dot Dot Dot. He will give us a, an overview of uh, what it took to really you know, uh, develop the project, but especially to explain um, you know, the background and the context of what it means to work with data uh, in, um, um, in relation with um, climate science. Uh, following Alessandro's introduction, we are gonna have uh, a very special performance that was um, taped live in the studio of the designers in Milan. Um, and it is um, a performance based on the data sonification program that they specifically developed for the console, which adds a musical or sonic dimension to this fully immersive experience um, of, the, of the installation. So, this, um, uh, the program uh, essentially adds an element of um, interaction that is connected to uh, the individual inputs and values, you know, that you can change while uh, using the console. And so this musical spectrum uh, encompasses negative and positive connotations, so that mirror this impact level of, of individual inputs. So accelerating the rhythmical accents or emphasizing the frenzy and the timber as the carbon footprint increases. So uh, and one important aspect of this, of this uh, program is that this is not a score, a musical score that has been written a priori, a priori but it's been developed with a software uh, with Super Collider, which is a software for real-time audio synthesis and algorithmic composition. So the musical, the score really reacts, you know, live to your um, interactions. So um, I let uh, you hear it first from Alessandro Sandro from Dot 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 and then enjoy the performance.
Good evening, this is Alessandro Masserdotti speaking. I'm one of the founder of Dot 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 and Hand of R&D. We are an interaction design studio based in Milano and we have been working on the last 16 years on interaction design. Interaction design is a field that tries to figure out how to make information and data usable and understandable for human beings. The overview effect is a cognitive shift in awareness reported by some astronauts during space flights, often referred to viewing the Earth from outer space. They usually talk about countries without borders and they start feeling the humanity as a unique and inseparable. This reflection or effect links me to talk about the Copernicus project, one of the most ambitious projects made by humans. With our collective action, we are mainly responsible of most of the disasters happen on our planet. I'm not talking only about climate change, I'm talking about oil ship disaster, I'm talking about fire, I'm talking about pollution. But as part of our nature, we have the good and the bad, we have the best and the worst. So we create this wonderful project that's called Copernicus Program. The program is made by six satellites that were sent in orbit for monitor the state of health of our planet. It is not a coincidence that the name chosen for the satellite was Sentinel. All of the data produced within this program are viable and mostly licensed as open data. Science and aesthetics, or science and art and design, as an ancient relation. The oval form became very popular in art and architecture after Klepper discovered that the planet orbit wasn't circular. We can even see the relation between the relativity theory by Albert Einstein or the uncertainty principle by Heisenberg with the Dadaism and the Surrealism well represented by Marcel Duchamp. Data are the new element of science and then at the same time are the new element and material for art and design. Our society produces an enormous amount of data. Let's just think about the social media and the amount of cut pictures that every day has been uploaded in the web. Or just think about the Copernicus project that produced 12 terabytes of data every 24 hours. So the main challenge now is how to make it profitable for both science and design. We now have more data than idea on how to use it. So our main effort is imagining any possible output out of that huge amount of data that we have. In the last few years, I heard a lot talking about data as a new oil, but here I do prefer talking about data as a knowledge or as a new way how to create concrete and evidence-based awareness. This is what we try to do for the installation we created for Matt. Find a new way how to create a relation between data and visitors. Find a way how to create a new relation between visitors and science using data as a medium. We try to avoid, in every step of the design process, introducing bias and prejudice, letting the visitors creating their own awareness about the topic. I think that, by working on this installation, we created a new paradigm and a new methodology for the future of exhibition and installation. It's not anymore entertaining or simplifying the message to keep it more simple or understandable is matter or keep it in touch with the emotion and the human being. In these fields, there's still a lot of work to do. As a human society, we produce a huge amount of data, but most of them are owned by big tech companies. But in the last 10 years, the open data movement has been growing a lot. Having access to data means having access to knowledge and having access to richness. So we do need to pretend that at least the data owned by the government or the one produced by the project founded by the government 
has to be released under Open Data License. Second, the same as we do with grammar for making people better understanding the languages that they talk, we do need to do the same with computer science for making people better understanding the world of the data and the digital. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoy our installation.
Well, this was wonderful. So we hope to, you know, get these guys here soon. Uh, it will happen. So, you know, keep on following us. Um, we really hope that they can actually do this live. Um, so we are done for this first part of the day. We are going to return in one hour. So at 5.30 p.m. Lisbon time, uh, we are going to have more conversations. We're going to start with the designers roundtable. So the team, the design teams that were involved in this uh, two exhibitions. We will have more to hear, uh, to hear from actual artists involved in the projects. And then we'll close the day with a very special performance happening live from the museum. So this is all for now. We are going to see you in one hour. Enjoy.
exactly. Sure. So where do you sit and where do I sit? I don't know. They will tell us, I guess. So I will be next to Max, no? I don't know, where is he? Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I quite like these uh, monumental yeah. faces yeah. here. Okay. You have to you have to say something. What they're they're sound Hello. checking already. <laughs> what you. else should I say? Do you hear yeah. me well? <clears throat> Hello. When I say things yeah. to everyone. <laughs> yeah. All good. Yeah. Should I okay. speak louder? Should I speak faster? Should I speak? <laughs> <laughs> do it well. A bit louder. You do it well. You, you okay. do it well. Okay. Yeah. I feel that yeah. I'm shouting. No. No. no, no, no. no? Okay. So okay. maybe I'm, I'm talking too low. Okay. Yeah. This we we can take off that later, right? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we can take it off later, yes, right? Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So we will be without mask. When you, when you are, when you are talking, you okay. Talking, okay. Talking, yeah. Okay. Right? So so <coughs> then uh, sh I should speak a bit lower. You can try now as, take a little bit as as normal. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Normal tone. It's perfect. Okay. To, mm. Like you shout like this, and you don't also like, mm. you can speak like normally because you're also you're on the exposition, so there's going to be people around. around. Yeah. Voice, okay. Noise, so mm. it's good for sure. You project your voice, but you don't need to shout. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Very but, good. For me, we're done. Uh, I think we're good. So I'm going to just read just your remarks, and okay. that's it. All right. Sure. Good. I always feel that I speak louder than everyone else, so I'm a bit afraid of that. <laughs>
It's okay here? Ah, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. Okay, I'm saying now a few words, and we're making a test, test, test for seven, uh, 530 Mesaradona dos designers in town. Um, estamos com Hipólito, Claude, Claude, Maia, Daniel, Joana e Max. E depois temos aqui, e em outros lugares, depois performance hip hop de músicos. Bairro de blá, 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 blá. I'm, I'm, I'm.
fait, il faut qu'on rentre. On rentre en scène. Non, non, c'est bon, c'est bon. Welcome back. Welcome back to Matt, for everyone to uh, join the second part of today's event. For those that are logging in only now, we have been uh, celebrating the new program, the new exhibitions and projects that we have here that open on April 5th and are going to be on view until September 6th here at the museum. I'm Beatrice Leanza, I'm the director. So um, we are going to start uh, another you know, three hours together uh, with a new set of uh, on-site, in 
artifacts and live events uh, with you know, more of the protagonists of this incredible project. So uh, in this first uh, conversation of, of uh, this uh, afternoon, we are gonna feature the designers round table. So uh, we are hosting the teams that have been at work with these two exhibitions. Um, in this spatial projects, notions of order, orientation, and organization relate to rather different narratives, structures, and storytelling needs. Uh, each though, having to confront the challenge to both offer guiding principles to the topics of the shows, while dealing with different scales of conceptual reach embodied by the different works present in the shows. So uh, this is going to be a special session because we're gonna have uh, get our guests partly here in the museum with us and partly online. So I am going to introduce them. So I'm gonna call to the stage first our guests here. So, um, Julie Albani, who is a critic, architecture critic and curator, is our moderator today for the conversation. Please, Julia, you can take your seat. Then we have Daniel Zamarbide from Bureau Studio. Pardon me for the horrible job I did in pronouncing your surname. <laughs> Please join us here on stage. And then Joanna Pestana as well, joining us here live. So, both of them have been at work with the exhibition X is not a small country. And then online, joining us, as you can see them behind, I will move so you can see them better. We have Ippolito Pestellini Laparelli from 2050 Plus Studio in connection from Milan, I believe, um, who's been, uh, who, studio who has been at work with the exhibition Aquaria. And then we have Claude uh, Marzotto and Maya Samboni from Obelo Studio has been in charge of the visual design for the exhi same exhibition for Aquaria. And then the team, in fact, of Max Ryan as well uh, online here, together with Joanna, who uh, developed the graphic and uh, visual identity of X is not a small country. So I am going to disappear now and leave the stage to you and to you, Julia. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you, Bea. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I also have to turn around uh, because we are pretty overwhelmed with um, all the guests we are having here on site and um, of course everyone that joins us um, live. It is pretty um, reassuring um, how exhibitions are needed and how exhibitions need um, the public. So, sorry. So, um, nice to see you all. Um, congratulations to the exhibitions, to the arguments that you brought together. We heard in the first session um, from the curators. Um, and um, I'm very curious to expand a little bit more on your part of the job, of these two quite diverse um, exhibitions um, that though make sense um, being now here um, together as, as, as they are both um, injecting quite um, critical thinking and thoughts. And um, maybe if I start from the first question that maybe can lead to a round, um, around this round table. So um, each of you could maybe respond to, to a first question that I have. And uh, that starts with the idea of an exhibition being a tool um, to influence uh, and contribute to the contemporary discussion because both exhibitions are really pretty much in the here and in the now. So um, how did you, in the collaboration with the curators and with the artists whose installations um, are part of the shows, how, how did how did your work evolve? How did your work develop in, in order to use an exhibition as a tool to do, to do this job? And maybe, Danielle, if you want to start, starting from <laughs> the exhibition that we are sitting, sitting in, X is not a small country. Yeah, th thank you for the question, Julia. Um, um, I, I see the, the exhibition as it is now, as part of an ongoing conversation. So I, I think, I think um, Ari Cormartina in the previous uh, session were 
uh, or, or in a video in the, in the website they were saying about, you know, how do we respond to contemporary events? And uh, I, w I would bring a slight difference to that maybe because I don't think there's anything to respond to but to react. So I think, you know, the, 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 the conversation that we started first with Arik and Martina, which has been extremely rich and fruitful, and then uh, with Joanna and, and, uh, and Max, uh, led us here to what we have today. Uh, whatever it is, <laughs> and and I see it as a, as a as a kind of like a frozen moment of a conversation that started there. And I could you know use the analogy of the blank paper, you know. So because of course I guess we will be talking about the grid and all the you know the the grid paper as well, the gridded paper. So I see it a little bit like that. You know, we started you know, on a blank paper with a, with a few sentences from Arik uh, and Martina, and uh, and then we started sketching somehow. And, uh, and I guess, uh, you know, at one point you have to stop that and then you open an exhibition. So that's where we are. Uh, but there is, I don't think there is any response to that. I think it's just a, a way of dialoguing together and also very fruitful conversations as well with uh, Joanna and Max. So um, at one point, all, the, all of these things materialize in a moment, which is now what you see. And, and, uh, and that, yes, I do consider it as part of a, call it research, call it uh, conversation or conversational, um, but, but, uh, but it's not a result, for sure not. So, you know, uh, uh, following up what was uh, discussed previously in the, in the previous session about, you know, the message of the co or the conclusion, I, I definitely uh, don't think there is any, but it's just, uh, um, and, I, and I go with what Martina was saying in, in, before that, you know, now I guess the people who see the, the show and they can, conclude if they want or participate to the to the to that conversation and uh, you know they will make up whatever they want I think the topic is extremely uh, uh, present and I think that that uh, you know the, the, the topic of post-colonialism and how do we deal with it as designers is kind of like a, a very heavy tricky and convoluted one uh, to, to use uh, Arik's words um, but it's uh, it's a topic that needs to be addressed continuously and I think uh, in our case, as exhibition designers, we address it very subtly and, on, and humbly, I hope, uh, accompanying the, 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 the pieces that are here, the, the, the eight pieces that are here, uh, all with different mediums and formats. And uh, I, I see our, our contribution to that, uh, to that as, a, as, a, as a very humble support. Uh, uh, but maybe we will talk about what it is exactly later, I guess. Maybe you want to add to this, Joanna, also in the collaboration that you obviously not only had with the curators, but also with Daniel. Yes, um, well, uh, of course, uh, I hope Mark, Max agrees. Um, <laughs> he's uh, right behind you. He's just right behind <laughs> me. Um, but um, yes, I think it was really important uh, that to, to highlight that when we started this, uh, work, uh, the, the identity design for uh, X is not a small country, um, Bureau were already working on it uh, before it, beforehand. And, um, and so it was really important to jump into the project not only with uh, the support of uh, the curatorial, uh, the curator, bo both the curators and both the conversations we had with Martina and Eric, uh, but also to to work from and with uh, the idea of the grid that was already part of the vocabulary that uh, Bureau were uh, working for this exhibition. So it really, it really influenced then what we developed from that, uh, specifically looking at the overview and looking at uh, from the God's eyes position and looking above, which uh, is something that um, that we're already working with this invisible grid that is kind of wraps up the uh, the planet Earth uh, in um, and and the exhibition space as well uh, uh, now around us. Uh, so those conversations were were extremely fruitful, um, and also continuously with Martina and Eric uh, throughout the process of uh, designing what became to be our system. Um, 
uh, Martin and Erica always prompt us with uh, really important questions that uh, even to define some, some of the um, data sets that we were targeting, etc. Uh, but Matt, Max, do you want to add anything to this? Um, not too much. I mean, great, great answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say that, obviously. But um, yeah, no, I didn't, just sort of similar to what Daniel was saying, just about it not necessarily being a sort of um, solid endpoint. I think it's kind of, it kind of emerged from that collaborative process and through some of the experiments we were doing along the way with, uh, yeah, well, in our case, with the sort of design combination with uh, some of the data aspects. But, um, Great. Mm -hmm. Great. So we go to Milano. Um, if also, um, maybe you want to expand a bit on, on the collaboration together with Angela in, in building the, 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 the show, designing the show. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, my collaboration with Angela uh, moves on, <laughs> on multiple levels because we are partners, so this uh, has been an ongoing conversation since uh, day zero, a truly process of exchange and collaboration like any, any exhibition design is. Um, I think there has been an enormous amount of overlap and intersections in terms of the way the exhibition design was actually coming about and the way the curatorial project was actually coming about to the point that in many ways they have overlapped one into each other in the sense that we see of course the exhibition design or our installation as a form of uh, support but also enhancement of the content that Angela and the rest of the curatorial team has put together. Um, we have called many times our installation a sort of exploded aquarium where this kind of a very rigid um, relationship between front end and back end um, is being somehow neutralized. Um, and in a way, our project is a sort of collection of floating pieces. It's almost like taking an aquarium and deconstructing the box of the aquarium. Um, and the deconstruction of the aquarium went a little bit in parallel to the need to deconstruct those Western and patriarchal mechanics that had built our culture of to live outside of nature, which is in a way the core of the whole exhibition. And when I say about overlaps um, between the exhibition design or what constitutes the exhibition design also in terms of materialization, there are several kind of osmotic um, let's say exchanges between the contents that you see in the exhibition and, for example, the materials that, they, that are actually uh, of which the, the exhibition is made of. Um, I like to think probably that the work that somehow we have connected the most to is uh, the beautiful uh, commission to Armin Linke or Scenarium, which is filmed in a way, as you know, inside the Scenarium, inside the backstage of the Scenarium, and those images have a lot of the same, let's say, materials, a lot of the same kind of a spatial devices that we've also used in the exhibition. So there's a sort of constant, uh, let's say, spilling in and out of uh, the contents that are supported by our work and, uh, um, let's say, the qualities of the um, spatial design. Um, this was only possible because, of course, we have somehow looked at this process as a sort of completely entangled conversation where there was never really a separation between uh, content and support, in a way. So uh, we see, at least in our practice as 2050 Plus, we see exhibition design as a truly critical practice, so something that tries to enter into uh, the very mechanics of the contents, the very cultural assumptions of the contents that are um, put on, on stage. Thanks. Um, I, I will get back to you on, on, on that with a few questions uh, of the explosion, but um, I wanted also to um, go around the table and have um, 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 Maya and um, Claude. Thank 
you want to share a little bit with, uh, with the audience about uh, your collaboration, both with Ippolito and uh, uh, Angela, in, in shaping this, um, this experience of the exhibition? Yes, we have joined the design team uh, on a late, in a later step in autumn. Um, we sh so the, the, the project had already taken shape in a way, it was in progress, but, and uh, I think we, our visual identity design, um, well, it's strongly rooted in, well, we received inputs from both the, the curator and, and, the, and the exhibition design that was, um, uh, that was in progress, especially um, our design uh, starts from um, Angela's pivotal idea of the aquarium as a conceptual object, as a speculative object. So this idea, as well as um, one of uh, the questions uh, she gave us um, while explaining us the content of the exhibition, that was uh, where should we see from? So a lot of inputs that we have uh, visualized in our in our system and also there is a, um, a strong affinity uh, between the visual system we have developed and uh, the 2050s exhibition design uh, especially um, in the way we address um, the relationship between yes front end and back end as uh, um, as Hippolyto was saying um, that we translated in a form of optical illusion that is constantly uh, questioning the viewer gaze between a sort of between background and foreground, um, 3D and 2D. Maya maybe wants to add something. Yes, so in fact, uh, like, uh Angela's, um, Angela's uh, concept of the exhibition was full of questions, like full of uh, pivotal questions. And the interesting thing is like uh, for an exhibition, not trying to give answer, but uh, by itself questioning the viewers. So instead of trying to respond or to fix something, uh, to set on some questions. So as Claude was saying, like the, our visual identity um, is addressing the viewer and uh, is or her perception, like uh, engaging them and in what they are actually seeing, what the, how they are ac actually active in generating narratives or responding to what they see. So as well also as 2050s design, which is something fluid with not like a, a fixed preset path, but the viewer can move uh, between research material, artworks, uh, everything connecting together. So. Mm, as well, so the idea is like to engage someone actively in responding to what they see. So this is also something we try to convey. Yeah, and then in uh, in the interviews that um, you all gave that are available on on, on Mart's website, um, actually you you um, you speak about. Um, Unraveling the, 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 the visitor's gaze, and um, and I really liked um, unsettling the viewer's gaze, and I really liked um, if you could expand a little bit on the graphic design that that actually welcomes the the visitor and sets a little bit the tone before actually seeing the first installation, um, and this idea of ambiguity. And my, my my direction that I want to 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 take is that no exhibition is neutral. Even if you don't give conclusions, uh, you don't point directly into something. You though manipulate through the choices you make in how text is being perceived, how images are being recognized, and um, maybe um, um, Claude and Maya, you can you can p quickly um, see how how you you took the challenge that Angela gave you with um, where's the viewpoint, where's the perspective that. Um, that, that, that you, you... Yes, you. We, we consider, ambig we embraced ambiguity as a strategy to engage the viewer, the, the visitor. Actually, in front of ambiguous perception, the viewer becomes aware that his, 
he's viewing, but also he's, he's looking at something, but also about the way his or her own perception is involved in making sense out of what he or she's looking at. So this was the, yeah, the, um, the idea about the optical illusion and many, many design choices. And um, um, Ippolito, I, 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 in, again, in your interview, um, you, you were expanding a little bit on the, on the um, percurso, the, 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 the direction that you are not um, directly indicating. So the, the, the visitor is though free to float inside the exhibition, but there is a transition that you indicate. So starting. Um, from a very dark, dense part into a more lighter. And my, my, my observation of the visitors um, was, was uh, and also myself, in, in, in moving through the, the exhibition and following the, the discourse that, that Angela uh, engaged me with, but I felt like it was very light for a very dramatic narrative. Maybe you can expand a little bit on, on this because you end up, and those who have not seen the exhibition, you end up in a very light, wonderful um, beach s s scenario f coming out of an exhibition that has a very urgent message. So I wanted to, uh, to hear your, your thoughts about that. Well, um, uh, as you know, the, um, you're right. I mean, there is not like a, a fixed parkour. Uh, there is not a fixed trajectory to follow through the exhibition, but the exhibition as a sort of sequence, it, it moves uh, across scales um, from the microscopic to the transoceanic. So in a way, the first part of um, Aquaria happens in a very dense and darker environment where this idea of theatralization, which is staged in Aquaria around the world, uh, it's actually made more evident through the use of, for example, blue lights and through the use of, let's say, um, a relatively denser and darker tone. Um, as we move through scales and as we move through the gallery of the mat, we approach basically a different kind of content. And that's when, for example, visitors meet the work of Julien Cruzet. And it's a moment in which suddenly the exhibition um, and the curatorial, let's say, sequence abandons uh, the discussion about aquarium as conceptual objects, like my and Claude was actually discussing before, abandons basically the idea of the enclosed box to embrace uh, another scale, which is the scale of the seas of transoceanic transactions. And that happens when, in parallel, the exhibition designs becomes lighter, in parallel, the gallery of Matt meets this beautiful skylight that makes the whole gallery in a way acting like an aquarium on its own. Um, in, let's say, in line of this sequence, uh, stepping into, um, let's say, this sort of beach, we call it. Uh, obviously, it's an image of a beach in a way. It's another form of theatralization. It's um, maybe um, a way for us to mark through the curatorial sequence and through the exhibition sequence, the definitive deconstruction of the box, which we hope, of course, is uh, in a way what the visitors and the audience have got from the layering of the materials from the first clusters into the last. So the beach is almost like a form of liberation from the nature to culture divide, which is symbolized by the aquarium by all means. Um. Coming to um, lightness, and, and you mentioned, um, Daniel, that uh, you hope you, you, you made a humble gesture. I, I, I felt very strong your, your gesture in pushing the visitor to make choices. And, um, and you also said it yourself, that um, while there is a grid, and maybe you can expand on the grid a little bit, but while there is a grid, there is um, the constant choice and the constant um, present of choices and um, of course with the, with the topic of the show I think uh, the influence uh, or the manipulation that you with confronting the visitor with these choices 
uh, is, is very strong. So I, I find it um, actually not humble in this, in this uh, sense. But maybe you, you can speak a little bit about the choices that... Um, yeah. Um, when I was saying humble, I guess I meant uh, to the relation of what we did uh, towards the art and design pieces, that the eight of them that are, that are in, the, in display in the, in the show. Um, I think that, you know, from the very beginning there was this uh, fictional companion, like, a, like your fictional friend, who was the grid. So, so this, this was a theme of conversation that materialized at one point in, in, in one sense. And I think the grid has this power somehow um, that, uh, that it's kind of like extremely useful and extremely useless. Uh, and I think, you know, the whole story of, of the grid in art and, 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 and architecture even more, you know, talks about that. So we were discussing this uh, first text of Russell and Krauss uh, on the grid um, that, that, you know, that, you know, provides this sense of schizophrenia when, when you talk about the grid because it's, it's a very referential kind of tool and at the same time it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's a still has this quality of blank. So, uh, so he has both. So I think that, that the grid, once again, using the allegory of the blank paper, became a, a sort of like a companion, um, a way to discuss, and, and, uh, uh, and also a way to how to figure out uh, the whole um, mise-en-scene of the pieces themselves, because they all have very different scales. They all evolved, actually, uh, during the process and uh, they have uh, different uh, materializations and so on and so forth. So um, even though the grid was a companion, uh, we still acted as a, as a very practical and pragmatic uh, you know, uh, way of putting things around and how the visitor actually would navigate. <laughs> yeah, I'm linking maybe with, with, the, uh, with the aquarium or, or dive into the, if to, into the show. And in this case, there are not really a lot of sequences somehow. There, there are pieces that are sort of floating. You can reference to them somehow. And, and uh, also using with the, with the poles and with the, uh, with the identity as well, you know, the, the, the idea of, of the peripheral views. So you're constantly called onto something that you're not looking at. Uh, you know, I, I really like, maybe, you know, as a provocative thing to say, uh, you could say that perspective was a bad idea, you know, it shouldn't have been invented because, you know, it's a theoretical tool uh, and maybe that forgot that actually when you're looking at something, there's not only one point of view. And I think that, of course, is, is, a, is an interesting parallel to all the post-colonial uh, topics. So in, here we try to maybe uh, manipulate, maybe it's a too strong word, but um, maybe to suggest continuously how to unfocus uh, with, uh, with the poles, with the, how we place the, the whole uh, exhibition design with the pieces themselves. And you know, the same way as we were using this grid as a fictional narrative, uh, we also invented this kind of symmetry that is a fake symmetry somehow or suggested symmetry with the wall kind of like partitioning uh, the oval space. Um, there is, it's, uh, you know, I must say it's a difficult space to work in. You know, it's, uh, it's not easy here. You know, I, 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 it's not a critic or not a critic, but it's not easy. Uh, and so the, the gesture of the wall uh, as, a, as a splitting gesture came quite quickly, even though I remember the very first conversation that I had with Beatrice was, you know, she, she, she kind of like said, like, no walls. You know, we don't want walls. So within, an, within a system, uh, that there are no walls, maybe a wall is strong enough, and uh, especially this one, I guess, that, yes. that doesn't play the same role. I mean, it's, I mean, for me, it doesn't play the same game as it played in the real, uh, in the real uh, situation, but here at least it splits very uh, drastically as well, maybe dramatically as well, uh, the space, and then, and then, yes, the visitor has to make choices and circulate around and uh, confront himself or herself to how to uh, cross the walls and come to the edges of the oval if, if she wants or not wants and confront itself with this fake symmetry where there are two big pieces in terms of size, which is this one, the brick lab work, and, uh, and the BART studio uh, on the opposite side. And, and in between there are a lot of uh, calls, let's say, attentions, uh, uh, perceptions, uh, kind of like sounds uh, that go up or down in scale. And in that sense, uh, you know, I. Still, uh, Carlos Carpa is always in my mind uh, in exhibition design. Of course, not in the form, but you know, in this way of addressing, maybe once again, not ma manipulating, but 
suggesting the next step. You know, once you're in front of something, what's what's next, and how do you call? So it's it's more of a soundscape uh, somehow. You know how these things uh, pop up. Uh, I, I don't really know if I answered your question, but yeah. I kind of like went away. But anyway, yeah, you also you also described the the, the different installations as characters. Yeah. That you that you place in the room. How much uh, interaction did did you have with the um, artists and architects behind these installations? Um, uh, yeah, that, that was uh, there were differences. So we were very much in contact with some of them and not so much with some others. Um, uh, of course, border wall was one of one of the the, the, the main. Uh, interaction we had with also for obvious technical reasons mm -hmm. um, uh, but it was also they, they were also very cool on the design part so, so that uh, that was also very interesting you know to know that you know it, design is not such a uh, you know like a iconic thing that you have to respect very uh, uh, and and uh, yeah with others we had less interaction but uh, I see that the pieces they evolved uh, I feel it today in a, in, a, in a very very nice way and it feels very uh, smooth somehow uh, here and then, yeah, when I was talking about the characters, I, I do feel that there is like a series of individuals that kind of like uh, participate to a post-colonial parade, <laughs> and and uh, now we are in the parade somehow. Uh, yeah, specifically with uh, <laughs> with uh, with all the all the show. So 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 we're part of the game. So uh, you know, I, I also think that it's it's kind of complex to relate to all of this. But I think you have to embrace that complexity, and I think that that in in uh, in aquarium um, the aquaria show is the same thing. It's, it's it's very complex to make yourself an opinion about what's going on. But I think uh, you know uh, of what's going on in, in both exhibitions. But I think that's good, you know. And this is something that somehow uh, uh, capitalism has kind of like uh, neglected or even rejected mm -hmm. that you you have to stay in complex situations and try to understand them somehow and not find. Uh, uh, results or answers. So I, you know, the floating feeling that you have in very differently in both exhibition, I, I kind of like relate them to that complexity uh, that you have to keep on uh, asking yourself, where am I? You know, what is all this? You know, uh, is this a building? Is this a model? I'm referring to Paulo's work. Um, is this a border wall? Does it make sense to put a Mexican border wall here in a very nice and protected museum? You know, and so, so you're part of the problem. Staying with the trouble, someone would say. <laughs> <laughs> you agree, or Max? Uh, mm -hmm. Can embrace on the complexity aspects that uh, Daniel is pointing out. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's interesting to hear. In, so I'm probably going to echo some of what Daniel has just said uh, in terms of the complexity, and also perhaps earlier in the talks uh, with Martina, she was talking a bit about how you know the, the sort of exhibition is slightly open to interpretation for visitors, and I think in how we've approached the, the graphic design of it. Again, it's very much trying to play off that, uh, how do you deal with like uh, such complex systems while sort of leaving them open to a certain degree to the viewer. Um, and again, I think if you, know, if you look around at the, the, the bits of the identity spot, um, you can kind of see that, that while we kind of, we're using these kind of circles uh, which act as almost infographics or sort of small little logograms. Uh, but they don't really give data as such. They are sort of, they are just describe relationships. And the fact we're sort of using perhaps, in many cases, we're you know, taking from various different sources. So we might be tracking Bitcoin or uh, Yeah, maybe you can explain usage. a bit about the sources. Yeah. What was that, sorry? If you could expand a bit on the sources. Ah. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I think for the, for the identity and uh, we would, as Joanna said earlier, we were kind of in discussion with the curators about this. We were, we were kind of almost uh, sampling the world, <laughs> which seems like a ridiculous and futile exercise in many cases. But um, and as a result, you know, the, the choices we make are not intended to be sort of an empirical measurement of the world particularly. But uh, they, there were things like, you know, again, particularly poignant ones, perhaps uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, the usage of flights or you know, airplanes in general, use of uh, video calling softwares or communication softwares, 
Um, I'm going to go blank and forget what the other two are. Uh, <laughs> Extraction. Okay. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think we were sort of taking these parts of Bootman. We were measuring these, this, these data sets over a period of time. And then when, when we sort of use them, we always use them like, like brush strokes, where we then combine sort of different data sets. And then it's up to the viewer or the, the visitor to kind of interpret them as they kind of encounter each piece of communication. I think that really, again, that kind of, just to link it back to what Daniel was saying, kind of really mirrors that this idea of the viewers being able to sort of, um, you know, interpret it in slightly their own way. And again, encounter the exhibition slightly in their own way and make, make, make choices as to what, how they, they interpret these things. I think Joanna might be able to expand so perhaps on the sort of the poeticism of that maybe. Maybe I would just uh, I would just add that uh, on that idea that I think uh, it was quite interesting what Daniel was mentioning of uh, losing the perspective and uh, and maybe um, you know these multiple uh, points of view that I think are called in this space that you can move uh, around and you never can see any piece by itself. Um, um, with a white wall behind. Um, I think we, we also try to, in our identity, to, to by playing with, with these elements, uh, by layering them on top of one another, um, uh, we try to expand these rhythms of movement that kind of uh, intersect one another and, um, and allow that complexity to, to really speak for itself. And, um, and just one thing to mention that on, on these different perspectives that I think could, could be furtherly explained is uh, that through, throughout uh, communication pieces, we, we, we see, you know, as Bertita was saying and uh, as Daniel was pointing out, and I think all of you, is that we, we left this uh, identity to, to continue to be open uh, in, in the way that it will shift with time and through, throughout the different communication assets it will shift and it will change s somehow. And uh, so from one math paper to the other you will have different data sets and you will have different satellite uh, images because each communication piece will take one different satellite and so uh, we will see different images, different positions of the Earth throughout the different communication pieces. Um, so, so yes, so we, I think we tried also to um, embrace the, the idea of multiple perspectives and, um, and uh, multiple positions, let's say. Okay, so, so probably, um, I mean, the exhibition is just opened, but I know that um, uh, Mark's, uh, Mart Extended platform allows for, for a lot of other parts of content that are not entering in the show, though conceived of, of, from, from you and also um, from, from all of you, are, are accessible on, this, on, this, on these online platforms. And um, um, maybe we, 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 we go back to, to, to the other side, to Aquaria, and um, because Damian mentioned the, the, the challenge that the gallery space uh, uh, posed on them, and um, uh, Ippolito, maybe, maybe you can um, uh, let us know how, how, how did the space challenge your, your, your design and um, how did you work with the building? And um, um, you mentioned that, um, this, that there is a space in the exhibition that almost becomes like an aquaria because of the natural light that enters from above. But um, how, how was it to work with this building? Uh, in the space? Well, I, I, I partially addressed that, um, but uh, it, it, it's not an easy building, I yeah. agree. Uh, it has, it's very peculiar, and obviously the space of our exhibition is very different from uh, um, access a small country um, and because it has a sort of more linear kind of uh, organization so in a way the sequence of the works and the sequence of let's say the uh, installation adapts to to the kind of space we wanted to react to it by enhancing the difference in scale you start from a very 
big, uh, let's say, section, and then this section somehow gradually becomes smaller and smaller. Um, and in a way, the curatorial sequence, but also the exhibition sequence sort of reacts to the kind of change in, in proportions. Um, yeah, we, 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 are lucky, we were lucky to work with uh, uh, a skylight that is open on the entrance uh, of um, the entrance of the mat, so on the Tejo, that brings uh, natural light in it, and, and that's when somehow the exhibition changes its pace. It's when the exhibition basically starts abandoning the box, as I was saying before, and uh, challenging uh, planetary scale or planetary discussions. Mm -hmm. I maybe want to go back to uh, one point that you made. You talked about drama, and I really like uh, what Daniel was saying before. I think, you know, um, aquariums are extremely violent places. It's just that that violence, as in many other systems of our contemporary society, is completely disguised. We don't see it, but it's there. Uh, somehow the exhibition addresses also this, uh, let's say, calmness uh, or invisibility of that violence. Uh, even in the materials that we have used, um, there are materials somehow that are ambivalent in the sense that they are associated to notions of care or violence, depending on the perspectives. It's the kind of conditions we live in. When you visit an aquarium, you would normally not imagine that the majority, or like 98% of the marine animals which are present in there are actually extracted from our seas. Um, and that's an enormous, let's say, uh, tragic and dramatic um, 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 fact, which is absolutely not um, undisguised or unveiled. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same violence that we do not uh, perceive when we tap something on our phone, because anything that we do, of course, brings to that together an enormous chain of frictions and complicated realities. Some of these, of course, are very well represented in the exhibition of X is a small country. So to go back to your question about why such um, exhibition is so soft in dealing with such a dramatic uh, or heavy topic and themes and data, that's somehow it's a, it's a sort of reflection on the uh, uh, let's say, um, not approachability or not trans, or let's say the lack of transparency towards these degrees of violence, which are in a way uh, present in many systems that we deal with today. Um, um, we have a few questions. Um, that uh, are paused from the audience. I will get to this audience in a second, but I would maybe share a first uh, question that we, we received. Um, what, do you think, uh, what do you think about the role of design on construction experience nowadays when the relation between physical and digital has been radically transformed? Thanks for the question. I don't have the name for who posted, but uh, anybody wants to take? I, I, I can just briefly introduce something. Um, I, I, you know, there's, there's always this idea that there's like huge transformations, that you know, there was something before and now something, and, uh, and uh, you were talking about soft, and I think those transformations are always very soft. So there has not been a radical change in pretty much anything, you know, things kind of like, uh, and that's, that's also the, the scary thing maybe, you know, things appear. So, and so I think we're living in a moment where design in all of its aspects has to uh, address different realities, which has always been the case actually. <laughs> uh, but now a new reality that we have to add to our work is the digital one without saying that the digital is going to replace the physical or the physical should be better than the digital or I don't know what. So this is a very, very old question about, you know, uh, uh, you know technology and all that. So I do think that we have to embrace it, yeah, and, and I think that uh, architects and designer, designers have to be part of that, part of that questioning, part of that game. 
uh, but without necessarily, you know, having this very dramatic position of one against the other. I think, you know, we have to work with both of them. And this is a very good uh, setup for mm -hmm. that discussion. You know, I mm -hmm. think there's nothing wrong about this. You know, it's mm -hmm. actually quite nice. Uh, so, I mean, the only strange thing is, this, is that this kind of setting has not happened 10 years ago. You know, why, why COVID has forced us to do this, you know? And, uh, so, so it doesn't. It does not mean that uh, that uh, we don't like to hug each other, you know, and, and it does not mean that uh, we don't like to travel or whatever, you know. I think the. I, I mean, once again, if we embrace that complexity, as I was saying before, then I I can only see things going better. So, as designers, we just have to be part of that. We just, you know, don't have to refuse one or the other. I think. Anyone from around the table wants to add something here? Mm. I think it's also pretty much um, um, I think obvious. It's responded quite well with me. You, you know, I was I was listening the other day to a to a small speech of uh, Bruno Latour on this, and uh, you know he was like saying computers work on electrical impulses, so you know you could think about computers as physical unities. And without computers, there's no digital world. So that's an interesting thought. Uh, I, would, I, I would like to tap on this, maybe. Um, of course, uh, you know, there is a lot to say about the material reality of data. Um, um, but I think there is an ongoing discussion, I think, in terms of the role that architects and designers can play in world building practices in digital realities. So I don't think it's just about bringing the two domains together. It's also about exploring the kind of uh, role or presence that our own disciplines can have directly in the digital space, which is a space that you know is experienced daily by four billion gamers, six billion users of social media, and so forth. Um, so to me, uh, simply this expands the repertoire of spaces that we can access and we can work in as designers. We have some colleagues from curating, from architecture, from design here also in this uh, wonderful space. I'm looking in the other direction. Maybe we have some questions. Question, more questions, so the online questions we have posed. Yeah, but okay, who can read the questions because I didn't get them? Can you? I, I don't have them. Okay, here comes the second question. Um, considering the times of forced distance we are living, could you share your experience of having to intervene in a space hard to ac access physically? How difficult was it to work in abstraction? So maybe. I think that question is more uh, important to the exhibition designers themselves rather than to us somehow, right? Uh, but uh, what do you think? Um, I would say that for for us it was quite it was particularly interesting um, to um, at least um, we we base most of our understanding of what the space would look like based on the drawings that bureau were providing um, and um, and of course of the knowledge of the space that we had beforehand. Uh, but I must say that um, the scale of this uh, big wall um, that becomes central to this exhibition became uh, much more visible when, when I finally came to Mart uh, by the end of the process. So COVID didn't allow for some of the, the, the pandemic didn't allow 
for so many visits as uh, we would potentially have that would maybe uh, unravel the scales of things that are actually so much part of um, of our um, of our exhibition. Uh, so uh, this monumental scale of the of the um, of of the wall that we have in this exhibition. Um, yes, it's something that we, we could not really understand from distance and therefore it's, and though it's quite central, so uh, that's quite a curious aspect. Mm -hmm. I would uh, I like that. Mm. Yeah, and in our case, I'm thinking about something right now that it's kind of, um, you know, thinking back that, that is interesting uh, in, in, in that very question is that Actually, we departed from the map of Enrique Galvao, which is an interesting thing now that you, that you ask that, because it is a way of you know, going uh, to colonize uh, a place uh, and, or places that you don't know. Mm -hmm. you know? So there is something about very, uh, you know, the very uh, uh, virtual act of, of colonization then that you, you have to start by you know, colonizing it through drawing, through mapping, and and uh, and uh, and I think that piece of work uh, from Enrique Galvao, who's a, a very interesting character as well, uh, pro and anti Salazar uh, at the same time. I mean, not exactly at the same time, but but I think that that very point of departure probably, and the fact that we were not uh, together with Tariq and Martina, um, probably I, I'm guessing now. Huh? I'm looking back took us to the grid as well, you know, so there's kind of like a chain of reaction. Okay, we were looking at abstraction of, mm -hmm. of uh, Portugal is not a small country, mm -hmm. of Antique Galbao, which is also an abstraction somehow, uh, and that, that was actually uh, tooled by a map. And then we kind of like transposed into another abstraction, which was the, you know, the, the complexity of the grid in 20th century. Um, and then, you know, that helped us maybe to uh, dialogue through this space. So we knew the space quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, have, we have been there here very often, so it was not a, a, a virtual experience. But I guess in the conversation with uh, Arik, Martina, and also Joanna and Max, you know, there was this uh, transposing of this abstraction of colonization of a space, you know, uh, which mm -hmm. was probably, uh, I mean, it's probably something to think about later on, uh, re retroactively. Uh, so maybe there was something, uh, something about uh, the situation itself that made us, uh, I mean, of course, that made the exhibition as it is now. Yes. So I remember at some point actually we, we were, Max and I, we were looking at views at map, map from uh, Google, Google Earth when mm. we were having conversations and it's quite, um, we were looking at views of maps from, from above, like throughout the year. And um, this is an approach you can have when you are working at distance, I guess. It's this, um, yeah, using other tools that are there and other, mm -hmm. um, that are there that can uh, scatter or explore the space differently um, and explore the themes of the exhibition differently that you couldn't do. Um, well, you could do otherwise, but you are more um, uh, moved or impelled to uh, look for alternative ways of observing your subject of interest when you have to be at distance. So I think that's something that the pandemic brought us into. Just to continue from what Joanna was saying, I think yeah, the, the kind of the, the new ways of trying to like, for example, I haven't seen the exhibition at all. I haven't seen the space for the last two years, I think. Wow. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's been quite interesting. Uh, but we, we, yeah, as Joanna said, we were looking at Google Maps. You know, I spent a lot of time on uh, you know Google image search <laughs> of all places, and you get to see all these different people's perspectives. So you know, suddenly you get my own understanding of the space being shaped by all these other countless perspectives that people have taken, um, which I find, I've found this kind of strange, it's just a strange experience to try and design through that, those multiple lenses. Um, and I guess, Jean was also mentioning scale, but obviously like, uh, and I guess this has taken place for most of us. Um, there's this kind of strange, uh, Conundrum where you are sort of you're, you're locked up in your own room at home or something, and it's very very small scale, and then you're trying to design for a large space. And I've been, and me and Joanna have been just sort of asking ourselves mm. if mm. you know the impact of 
being in these small contained spaces has actually impacted just our, our sense of scale in the first place, which has been just a strange, again, another strange question just to ponder. So no, no answers, just questions. Okay, we're almost, uh, we're already a little bit over time, but I wanted to um, uh, also look to, towards Hippolyte uh, Maya and Claude. Do you have any uh, thing to add to the question, the last question that was posed? I don't want to cut you off before we yeah. end here. From our point of view, uh, the, the distance haven't, um, didn't affect that much the design process. We also were lucky because we live in the same city, so we, we w it was possible to meet. And, uh, but I wanted to, <laughs> to share an interesting experience we, 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 we had. And actually, um, due to the COVID restrictions, we haven't had the opportunity to visit the Aquarius exhibition yet. Yeah. But uh, we, we, for the first time, I had a virtual, a guided virtual tour into the exhibition. Um, thanks to Susanna from the educational, math educational team. It was really uh, amazing. I mean, we, we knew the space because we knew it through the design process, but having the opportunity to go through was a completely different experience. <laughs> and also I think, uh, no, Go ahead. Uh, concerning the, the question before about the digital and the, and the physical, and I, and I was thinking that maybe in, a, in an exhibition, especially in an exhibition such as Aquaria, that aims to question or explore the glass wall, uh, I think the physical dimension is so important. It would be difficult, because actually any screen is the glass wall. So, uh, it would be difficult to um, <laughs> make it work yeah. <laughs> yeah. out of a physical space. I think it is a very strong physical experience. Okay, we are, we are looking it forward is. to come there. Yeah. No, we really. Okay. Thank you so much. And this is just the beginning. Um, I recommend um, watching and listening uh, to to much more they have to say in the interviews that Matt uh, produced, really nice uh, ones. Thank you so much. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, um, everyone Thank here. And looking forward to the next vlog. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. Really, I wish, you know, we had really more time for this kind of conversation. But I, I, re I want to just make a comment on this because uh, this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to have this talk. Uh, I think it's very important what happens in places like this. So uh, the idea that there's always a certain multiplicity, you know, forms of, you know, of depth and, and superficiality too, you know, like the contribute to experience that doesn't necessarily have to be a physical one. But there's no other places really in our current societies where there is a freedom to kind of make also clashing views coexist without you know, making that place a contested territory. So I really want to thank you for what you have done because it was very difficult. I really know this, but the outcome, well, speaks for itself. So thank you very much again. So we'll have to clear the stage because we're going to move into the next session. Thank you again. Um, so uh, a little bit as we did um, in, uh, you know, for, uh, for the first part of the day, we are going to actually now um, call in some of the protagonists of, of, uh, of the exhibitions per se. Um, and uh, so you'll be happier to know that these sessions finally can happen you know, here on site and live, uh, different type of interaction. Um, so for our following session, we are going to invite, uh, and I am gonna call them so they can join us here on the stage, uh, artist Alice Dosraj, that is in the exhibition Aquaria. Sorry, I think she's coming from another side. Anyway, Alice is gonna join us here very soon. And then architect Paolo Moreira, whose piece instead in installation is part of uh, the exhibition X is not a small country. 
And uh, in this conversation, we have invited the design critic and curator Federico Duarte to play MC. So please, if, we can, if you can all come to the stage. Sorry, didn't know where you were coming in from. So we are gonna be safely distanced. <laughs> and after you can remove your mask. So we are waiting for Paolo. <laughs> it's coming up. So uh, in this talk that actually um, Fred uh, has entitled Here and Elsewhere, uh, they are going to look uh, at ways in which their shared local origins. So we are going to dig a little bit more into you know, the beautiful context of this um, location where we are, this place where we are. So how their shared local origins relate to notions of both site specificity and the dispersed outlook uh, of their projects. Uh, this conversation, for those that are following online, is going to be held in Portuguese. And following the conversation, uh, both Fred and Paolo will introduce our next and final act, which is a very special performance that we are extremely happy to have uh, here at MAT for today. And it's related to the project that Paolo will, uh, will discuss. So I let you the stage. Thank you, Beatrice. Obrigado. Um, pronto, estamos aqui então para o que se chama a sessão local, dito aos do, dos participantes uh, portugueses destas duas posições, daí ter chamado um, aqui e noutros lugares, ou here and elsewhere, e porque refletimos, refletindo precisamente a origem local, tanto do Paulo como da Alice, mas também aquilo que eu acho que são as posições deles nestas, nestas exposições, que são Uh, que tem uma particularidade muito interessante, que são as duas, tanto a Aquária como o, o Ex is not a small country, são exposições que celebram a interdisciplinaridade, ou seja, não são exposições nem de arte, nem de design, nem de arquitetura, são exposições de todas estas disciplinas. E são representadas também, ou são compostas por posições e posicionamentos de vários autores. E estamos aqui então na presença de dois autores portugueses, tanto o Paulo como a Alice, e que se calhar a maneira como eu gostaria de começar esta conversa é um pouco também falando, pegando um pouco o que a Júlia falou, a Júlia Albani, que me precedeu aqui no, no lugar de moderador, ela falou da, da, da impossível e diria eu a indesejável, indesejável neutralidade das posições. E daí eu queria saber, se calhar começando pela Alice, que é uh, qual é a posição que trouxeste para esta exposição? Um... Ok, eu na verdade confesso que acabei de ver a exposição pela primeira vez. Uh, o diálogo com a Ângela já, já estava a acontecer há, há mais de um ano, aliás, esta exposição foi ideada há muito tempo, a Aquária, uh, e tive prim pela primeira vez a oportunidade de perceber o contexto em que o meu, o meu projeto, o meu trabalho uh, se insere uh, né, no contexto desta exposição. E, um, e não sei, no seguimento do que tu disseste, não diria necessariamente que traga uma, uma posição necessariamente local, portuguesa. Uhum. Aliás, o filme foi produzido uhum. na Holanda, onde eu, onde, eu, onde eu vivi durante muitos anos e, ainda, e, e onde ainda estou conectada. Um, por isso é interessante, de repente, ver o filme de novo. O filme já foi mostrado em Portugal outras vezes, mas ver o filme no contexto de uma exposição... Um, com vozes internacionais e por vezes com vozes internacionais até do contexto sobre o contexto português como é por exemplo o trabalho do Armin Link que uhum. estava agora mesmo a ver um, em que ele olha para o, para o cenário de Lisboa eu penso que o meu projeto é um pouco oposto não é através um, da minha posição enquanto pessoa que cresceu aqui não é estou a olhar para um contexto uh, no, no, neste caso de um animal específico de uma espécie uh, mas que habita aquários holandeses não é um, Uh, por isso sim, não sei uh, sim. aqui neste, neste, penso que talvez possa responder, não sei Sim, para quem não tenha conseguido ver a exposição a peça da, da Alice chama-se Mood Keep e é sobre um axolotl que é uma espécie originária do México que se considera que está extinta no seu habitat natural oh, e que vive é. ou que, diz em vias de extinção, em de extinção sim, sim, sim. Sim. e que vive, como a Alice já disse previamente numa entrevista que vive tanto entre entre o cativeiro de aquários como entre os JPEGs, não é? dos nossos ecrãs. E acho que é interessante também como é que uh, traz esse, esse, esse teu olhar para essa espécie, que é um olhar, e podes falar sobre isso, que é um olhar disperso, porque é um olhar... Um, os axolotos que tu filmaste foram filmados na Holanda, e tu apelas uma espécie de 
é, comunhão entre os axolótulos e talvez queiras falar sobre isso uhum. mas é uma coisa interessante que é a maneira como a peça é colocada na exposição e que tu convocas o visitante ou a visitante a ver é muito particular, talvez queiras uhum. falar sobre essa questão também Sim um... oh, Está aqui o feedback uh, Sim, a peça um, o filme neste caso é um filme que olha para a para esta espécie de facto em vez de extinção, que tem uma história uh, muito particular, não é? Desde, desde o modo como. Ou seja, é um, diria que é uma espécie que está em vez de extinção quase desde o século XV, não é? Sim. Desde que os, os espanhóis chegaram ao México no século XV, fizeram a drenagem dos lagos, posteriormente uh, fizeram, iniciaram o processo de colonização e uh, até hoje, não é? Em que o lago Sossimil continua um pouco, um bocado, não é? Ainda não continua um bocado o lixo da cidade do México, digamos, um, e, e, e que ao mesmo tempo este animal, lá está, que eu cheguei, no fundo eu cheguei a este animal, por, exatamente como estavas a dizer, através de JPEGs, não é? o, o assalote começou a ser assim uma espécie, começou a ser muito mediado na internet, uh, 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 por via de mimes, as pessoas faziam muitos mimes com o assalote, era, um, era considerado um animal estranho, estranho e fofo e de facto inspirou... Uh, várias animações japonesas tipo Pokémon, uhum. etc. Aliás, a peça chama-se Mood Keep, que é o nome de um, um Pokémon, sim. De um Pokémon um, que, inspir, que foi inspirado pelo, pelo, pelo Asolot. E eu comecei a entender um pouco neste, nesta espécie um, um conjunto de tensões, ou um foco de tensões, várias tensões muito específicas que dizem respeito à, à nossa mediação, à, à, à mediação online e, e o que é que isso significa quando se, quando se extrapola um, esta comunicação lá está a mediação mas especificamente olhando para uma espécie de extinção e, 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 ou seja o que é que, o que, é que estas, estas criaturas com sorrisos permanentes olhos, olhos bugalhados o que, é que, o que é que está por trás mas digamos e na exposição a nível mais físico material não é uh, o filme está uh, uh, acho que agora se calhar, as podemos ver imagens do filme não necessariamente do da, 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 ah, deixa, da instalação, da instalação. Uhum. Uhum, mas o filme está instalado num ecrã que, que está disposto ao nível de um aquário de casa digamos de um aquário de interior uhum. uh, um pouco a, a nível de, uh, um pouco abaixo do nível da cintura digamos e, um, e uma, há uma luz cor-de-rosa por cima de, de, um, de uma carpete de cor-de-rosa também para as, para as pessoas poderem sentar e ver o filme à altura do, à altura do assalote já mediado pela, pela mediação do, que é o aquário não é? Pela, pela, pela barreira do aquário, digamos um, há um pouco esse, essa alusão no, assim, no, no fundo no aspecto material da peça neste, da instalação neste momento Sim, foi por isso também que eu falei, pensei nesta ideia do aqui, portanto, o uhum. aqui da tua peça, tu pensaste muito bem, não é? Uhum. Se calhar passando agora para a peça do, ou para o projeto do Paulo, o aqui do projeto do Paulo é uma maquete, mas é uma maquete que é apenas o início de uma exploração e de, de, de um pensamento sobre um lugar, não é? Sim. Se queres e, falar sobre isso. E, a tua e, posição e, também e, e sobre de uma, isso. De uma, de uma colaboração, eu Exato, acho que quando, quando começaste a perguntar qual teria sido o meu posicionamento, Uh, faça ao convite para participar na exposição não é? e, e desde já uh, bom uh, agradeço muito o convite para esta conversa é muito emocionante podermos estar aqui sentados e termos uh, as pessoas com quem trabalhamos connosco, etc um, um, é engraçado porque eu, eu estava a tentar quando propuseram fazer esta conversa eu estava a tentar encontrar pontos com o trabalho da Alice, obviamente numa exposição completamente diferente com outra curadoria, outro tema, etc mas ao ouvir agora a Alice, eu percebi que este, este projeto, de certa forma, também trata de, um, de uma espécie em vias de extinção, que é, é o bairro da Jamaica, que é um bairro que, que não devia existir, não é? é um bairro que, que espera há anos por uma solução de realojamento digno e, e, enfim, e, e está aqui uma situação meia, meia em suspenso que, que devia ser resolvida. E, e quando os curadores, o Arik e a Martina, me desafiaram para participar na exposição, surgiu esta ideia de abordar o bairro da Jamaica como um caso realmente dramático aqui em Portugal, não é uma questão também de contexto local, que era um bocadinho esse o meu papel aqui nesta, neste grupo. Um, e, e de alguma forma o meu posicionamento foi, foi, foi pensar numa colaboração. Portanto, eu à partida sabia que a resposta era colaboração, só não sabia qual era a pergunta ainda. Uhum, uhum. E, e a pergunta fui procurá-la no, no bairro, não é? A minha primeira... Uh, a abordagem foi procurar a Associação de Moradores e foi, foi recebido de braços abertos, pelo, na altura pelo, 
pelo Sr. Salim Mendes, era uh, Presidente da Associação de Moradores, que uh, abraçou o projeto e por, proporcionou um encontro com um coletivo chamado Chão, Etno, uh, Oficina da Etnografia Urbana, e o José Sarmento Matos, um, um, um fotógrafo e, e fotojornalista que estava a trabalhar no bairro, e dessa conversa, desse diálogo, surge o projeto, depois torna-se um projeto vivo e numa colaboração realmente muito in, imersiva. Um, foi, foi, foi a partir daí dessa, desse diálogo e dessa, dessa, desse cruzamento disciplinar também que surge, surge o projeto. Sim, e precisamente o, o projeto da Jamaica que vocês, que vocês trouxeram aqui, então tu, o Chão, o Coletivo Chão e o Gerson Armento de Matos, é também um, uma continuação de um trabalho maior, para já o Chão já faz há muito tempo no, no bairro, não é? E que o Gerson também tem feito, e que vocês trouxeram aqui como uma espécie de primeiro ponto de contacto com uma realidade que não só é a realidade específica do bairro, e como tu falaste bem, é um bairro que não deveria existir, então é uma ideia de, de impermanência ou de... de, de de impermanência, sim, do próprio bairro, mas também esta ideia de que, gostaria até talvez que falasse um pouco sobre isso, como uh, através da carta aberta que foi escrita em 2017, este bairro também significa outros bairros, ou também uh, representa outros bairros informais que não deveriam existir e que, e que estão aqui também representados de alguma forma. Claro, uh, é, é, é muito, eu acho que a, a potência, digamos, do, do, do projeto é exatamente trazer aqui alguma, algum debate, ou abrir aqui um debate e dar alguma visibilidade a um caso, que é, no fundo, um exemplo de outros que existem ainda numa capital europeia no século XXI, em plena, enfim, uh, área metropolitana de, de Lisboa. Uh, há vários bairros, vários com bastantes moradores, números até impressionantes de, de pessoas que vivem com condições ainda muito precárias, não é? Ao nível de infraestruturas, de acesso enfim, a, a, a condições mínimas de, de, de habitabilidade e de dignidade e, e essa carta aberta surge de um grupo, de uma associação dos moradores de quatro bairros, o bairro de 6 de Maio, o bairro de, da Torre o bairro da Jamaica e a Quinta da Fonte esse, esse grupo em 2017 faz um apelo com uma carta que nós apresentamos no projeto e daí despleta todo um processo que, no fundo, inicia o, o realojamento, que era um plano para 4, 5 anos, se não me engano, ou 6 anos. Não, 2018, 2022, seria, seria esse, uh, o... Uh, o horizonte temporal. Sim, sim. Um, o, o projeto de realojamento começa, portanto, uh, há, uma, há um grupo de, de famílias que são realojadas, há uma das torres do bairro da Jamaica, que é demolida, em 2019, é o Bloco 10, que, no que, é, o que está é, é o que está representado aqui na, uhum. nesta peça, e que uh, e desde aí ficou o, o caso em suspenso. Uh, nós temos algumas imagens do, do, da peça, para quem estiver em casa e não tiver não conhecer a peça, se calhar podemos partilhar. Uh, no fundo, uh, também foi interessante iniciar... Uh, enfim, esta, trazer esta ideia até é muito disciplinar, diria, no, no caso de, na disciplina da arquitetura. É uma, é uma maquete e não há nada mais convencional numa exposição num museu do que pôr uma maquete em cima de um plinto, não é? Mas, mas o interessante foi jogar exatamente com esse conceito. A imagem podia permanecer, se calhar, e, e, e mostrar que é uma maquete depois viva, ou seja, é uma maquete que ela serve mais como uma âncora ou como um abrigo para acolher depois uma série de conteúdos que se passam por, pelas fotografias do José Sarmento Matos e do seu trabalho fotojornalístico que está a desenvolver no bairro. Passa pela carta manuscrita eh, pelos, pelos moradores, com também eh, tradução em inglês, uh, e alguns retratos não só dos espaços interiores do, do bairro, pouco conhecidos ao, ao nível do público, não é? mas também alguns retratos e, e depois um, um vídeo também, que é um, é um documentário muito emocionante, uhum. com, que, que julgo que aparece na próxima imagem, e que é feito uh, por um grupo de moradores que, que o José uh, convidou e com quem colaborou, e, 
e acaba por, por ser uma forma também de conhecermos o bairro por dentro pelas vozes dos próprios moradores que se entrevistam e que nós vamos ter a oportunidade de ver mais à frente. Exatamente. Mas eu, eu gostaria de passar por uma outra pergunta, também comum aos, a vocês os dois, que é como é que os vossos projetos que estão aqui refletem um pouco a vossa prática, tanto como arquiteto do Paulo como como artista uh, Alice. Um, se eu continuaria por ti, Paulo, e depois fecharíamos com a Alice. Que é como é que este, eu sei que tu já tiveste um trabalho também com com um, bairros informais, com o, com, com o teu trabalho em Luanda, e também como é que gostaria de comentar assim, como é que a vossa pesquisa, as vossas questões que vocês trazem à vossa pesquisa são tornadas públicas. No teu, caso, no teu caso, como é que o teu trabalho não só é feito dentro da academia, enquanto estudante de doutoramento, enquanto investigador de doutoramento e pós-doutoramento, mas também enquanto pessoa que expõe em exposições e museus e centros culturais ligados à arquitetura e à a cultura do projeto, digamos. Uhum. Bom, eu, eu, eu interesso-me por, por estes casos complexos, pela, uhum. pelos conflitos urbanos e sociais que existem nas nossas cidades, uh, em vários contextos, não é? Como disseste, comecei com esta, com esta experiência também muito prolongada de, de investigação em, em, em Luanda, mas uh, desde aí tenho procurado, noutros lugares, olhar e contribuir, de certa forma, para... Um, para ser uma espécie de, de facilitador do conhecimento local, ou seja, eu acho que cada caso é um caso e interessa-me aprender com, esse, com essa especificidade, o contexto, quais são, quem são as pessoas e o que fazem, quais são os grupos que atuam ali, quais são essas, uh, enfim, essas histórias e, e a partir daí uh, procurar contribuir, quanto mais não seja, para consolidar a memória coletiva dos lugares, porque... Uh, falando de bairros que sabemos que vão desaparecer e esperamos que isso aconteça e acho que toda a gente quer sair daquele bairro as pessoas não, não, não querem viver naquelas condições e, e até é perigoso no, no caso uh, no entanto, enquanto isso acontece ou enquanto não acontece nós podemos também contribuir para trazer ou ativar um bocadinho o debate uh, sobre, sobre o caso uh, aí também estamos a a fazer com que outras pessoas que não iriam normalmente àquele bairro possam conhecê-lo, não é? E aí uhum. acho que o museu funciona como uma ponte. Uhum. Uh, é óbvio que eu, sendo, enfim, tendo sido convidado para trabalhar aqui, tenho alguma uh, proeminência, nem que mais não seja estar aqui neste debate e não todo este grupo, mas, no entanto, tento que essa proeminência mostre também que, um, que este pode ser um projeto vivo que pode, possa funcionar e acho que estamos, estamos a, enfim, no início de um, de, um, de um processo que eu acho que não acaba na exposição, não é? A própria, quer o programa público do MAT, que vai trazer pelo menos um ou dois dias de debates em volta deste caso. Vai ser em junho, não é? Em junho, sim. Junho. sim. Uhum. Ah, no final de junho, com vários debates, com pessoas ah, ligadas ao bairro, a outros bairros, mas também à política ou ao ativismo ou outras áreas, enfim, pessoas ligadas ao urbanismo, etc. Que, que, lá está esta ideia da, da peça como uma âncora que depois atrai outras, outras conversas um, e, e acho que se completam um projeto. Não é? Boa. E, e, e em termos do teu trabalho, Alice, o teu trabalho também é muito baseado na investigação e na pesquisa. Uhum. Nós tivemos uma conversa prévia entre, entre os três na, na quarta-feira e que falámos durante imenso tempo e uma das coisas que a Alice falou que ficou comigo na minha cabeça foi que, que faz parte do trabalho do artista a questão da pesquisa, não é? Que, e tu falaste sobre isso. Um, sim, eu, é, claro, nem toda a gente se identificaria desta maneira, mas claro. eu também me questiono um pouco qual é o artista que não investiga. Exato, seja, foi exatamente essa frase exato, que tu disseste. Exato, seja, seja a investigação académica, não, quer seja a investigação académica, quer não seja, há sempre um processo de olhar, não é? de investigação, há, um processo, há processos não é? que se desenrolam e que têm que ver com, um, com veres e com, com, com juntamentos de interesses e, e por que não, porque, porque não chamar isso pesquisa também. Uh, mas sim, eu diria que, enquanto artista, a minha pesquisa poderia ser entendida como talvez um pouco mais uh, tradicional, não é? formal, académica até. Um, e, mas, mas também, ou seja, é um processo de desconstrução disso também. Eu não, neste, com, com, como é exemplo o trabalho Mudkip, que está aqui na exposição Aquária, 
um, eu normalmente parto de um, de um objeto, uma espécie, um elemento, uh, um determinado dado transhistórico e a partir daí um, há um conjunto de questões que, que para mim são importantes e que se desenrolam a partir daquele objeto, neste caso o Asolot, não é que é o sujeito, mas que me ajuda a pensar e, e reconstruir um conjunto de narrativas de, de poder, de, de, de assimilação, etc. Um, e, que, e que sim, que depois eu normalmente, e é, é assim, falamos também sobre isso, não é? Sim. Um, que eu tenho tendência a extrapolar e a, e a, e a usar como objeto de, depois de, não só ficcionalização, mas de especulação também um, ficcional, muito pelo, pelo meu próprio interesse em ficção e em ficção científica, ficção, fantasia, etc. Um, mas, mas sempre de um ponto de vista, de, uma, de, um, de um ponto documental, depois extrapolar uh, e repensar futuros através do presente. Uh, ou repensar o presente através do futuro, neste caso. Uhum. Um, e, e sim, é muito, muito isso que é o muito que pediria. Um, que, entre, Neste, neste, ao olhar para esta espécie e, e trazer a minha própria uh, a minha própria narrativa e a minha própria, a minha própria ficção ou, ou construir uma ficção uh, baseada nas minhas próprias expectativas do animal também um, também permite-me trazer a minha, a minha voz pessoal a, um, a uma questão que é real e que, 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 é, e que é preponderante num determinado momento não é? uhum. Sinto que o teu trabalho reflete muito também sobre estas questões contemporâneas da tecnologia de, uhum. de, de um ceticismo na, no até na promessa da tecnologia hum. e talvez queiras falar de uma outra obra nós falámos também da outra obra que estás a trabalhar agora não sei se o quanto tu queres sim, sim. falar um pouco sobre isso para também um pouco entender e também vale a pena dizer que, que a tua peça do mundo que tu falas e, e, e problematizas a questão do aquário que é, uhum. que é a questão central da exposição que temos aqui a visitar não é? exato, exato, o aquário enquanto enquanto, enquanto dispositivo exato. enquanto dispositivo colonial não é? uhum. de, de, de disposição do que é um habitat natural outro, uh, muito associado à ideia de, de, de o que é o outro um, e, e trazer o outro para o ocidente dentro de, um, de uma caixa uh, transparente não é? um, e que comporta, e que, e que nem sequer é necessariamente real, nem documental, é, uma, é, uma, é só por ser uma ficção, não é? Uma ficção do que é, um, por exemplo, um habitat, um, um habitat dos, dos corais australianos, por exemplo. Uh, é sempre uma expectativa ocidental sobre, não é? Um, mas, para, sim, para responder à tua pergunta anterior, à tua, à tua questão anterior, sim, eu, 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 lá está, estas questões nunca são muito, tu, tu só te dás conta delas exatamente quando falas sobre o teu trabalho, de certa maneira, ou repensas sobre ele, porque não, mas sim, são, são questões que me acompanham, estas, estas tensões entre natureza e tecnologia, entre uh, cultura e ciência, um, e que, é, que estão presentes no Keep e que me acompanham até Outros, através de outros projetos que tenho desenvolvido e agora um, este filme também tô, tô, que acabei tô, no qual estou a trabalhar sobre um, a, a possível construção de uma base de lançamento de pequenos microsatélites numa ilha dos Açores em Santa Maria uh, e que joga que é uma ficção sobre ou, já, é uma toque ficção diria até sobre essa sobre esse, essa, essa uh, esse projeto sim, né? sim, sim. Uh, esse projeto é comercial e, e, e de alguma maneira também um, extrativista, uhum. uh, mas que joga, mais uma vez, uh, a solote, base de lançamento, uh, a partir do, do, uh, de uma especificidade desenrola-se um, um conjunto de narrativas e de questões. Sim. É para complementar, agora fazendo outra, uma, uma pergunta que depois comecem em, comece em ti e depois acabo no pau, que é a ideia entre uma, uma, um paralelo entre, entre impermanência e resistência, que é muito interessante que eu acho que as vossas dois, dois projetos trazem aqui ao museu e entender como é que o museu, como o mate, é um, é um lugar por excelência para falarmos também sobre isso. Porque às vezes não estamos à espera, estamos à espera que o museu seja o, aquilo que vamos encontrar que é para ser colecionado, para ser guardado para a posteridade, mas os vossos dois trabalhos apelam-nos a, a uma parte do falas do Axolotl como o Axolotl é uma espécie de salamandra que nunca cresceu da adolescência, não é? portanto há uma ideia de, de impermanência e também de relação que o Axolotl interpela o, o a espectador ou o espectador. Nisso acho que é interessante, gostaria de ouvir falar um pouco sobre o vosso trabalho como essa ideia, através das ideias de permanência e resistência. Uhum. Uh, no lugar do Axolot, é, um, é uma espécie que, no fundo, que só por existir, uh, de alguma maneira, 
questiona todas essas tensões Exato. de binónio uh, antropocêntricas, não é? De, de, de binário, de, de uh, criança, adulto, uh, feminino, masculino, dia e noite, animal, uh, na, uh, humano, não humano, não é? Um, e que é uma espécie que só pela sua existência impermanente, lá está, ou de, ou de impermanente ou de permanência, porque fica sempre adolescente, sim, sim, não é? sim. Um, imutabilidade, Uh, um, comporta, uma, uma, um, um, comporta uma posição de resistência só por si e quando, se pensa, quando pensamos na história lá está, na história colonial do Assolot inclusive há um, para mim uh, um, ao olhar uh, ao, ao participar de, uma, de, uma, de um cruzamento de olhares diria até com o Assolot há qualquer coisa que, que, que é fixa e quase, e quase petrificada sobre o animal, não é? O sorriso permanente, a permanência da adolescência, a permanência dos olhos, olhos não, exato, não pescar os olhos. Um, e como é que só. A, 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 e, e é um animal que a partir é passivo, não é? Que parece passivo, está sempre está quieto, não se mexe muito e que só. E pela permanência, e, pela, e, e, e é um, um plano que eu, muito longo que eu tenho no filme, inclusive, que é um plano do Assolot, a olhar para a câmera durante quase uh, dois minutos, não é? Há uma, há, um, há uma resistência na permanência do olhar, não é? Uhum, uhum. E no olhar de volta, uh, porque o, o Assolot, que vivia no lago só mil nas, nas profundezas do lago, não, não era a partir de um animal para, para, para estar num aquário, para, necessariamente, não é? Porque não, mas. Um, e há um, eu sinto que, essa, é, para mim, são interessantes esses, esses jogos de olhares, não é? de, de, há, o, o assolote está dentro do aquário e é olhado, mas há, há também um, um, algo de, de, de resistente quando, quando esse olhar é mantido, não é? mesmo que não se, mesmo, claro, agora estamos a falar de, é, não sei qual é a perspectiva do Assolot, mas, mas há qualquer coisa de, uh, um, iconográfico nisso, diria até. E yeah, até vale a pena dizer, não sei se é um spoiler, mas há uma resistência na parte da ficção uhum. que tu introduzes no filme, que é essa altura, há um momento em que os Assolotos têm, têm agência, eles, uhum. eles fazem alguma coisa e aparentemente até fazem conjunto, não é? Exato. E a o ato da resistência também está aí, está um bocado em, em ir... ir para além das nossas expectativas, uhum. do que é que ele pode ser. Não é? uhum. Exatamente. Uh, pronto, claro, spoilers. <risos> sim. É certo. Mas venha ao mato de qualquer forma. Sim, sim, sim mas é certo. Sim, é, é, e entra a minha parte. O filme é um filme documental, é, é, da minha perspectiva, do meu contacto com este animal, e, e a certo ponto eu extrapolo uma narrativa em que sim, em que uh, assolotes começam a desenvolver pálpebras e fecham os olhos, uh, e há um corte com, este, com esta permanência do olhar. E, um, exatamente porque, na verdade, é baseado numa questão real, não sim. sei se já tinha sim, dito, sim, sim. Sim, que eu vi um vídeo no YouTube em que um, um, uma pessoa que, que é dona de um assolote, de repente, vê que o assolote desenvolveu, de facto, pálpebras e começou a pescar os olhos, ou seja, seria uma mutação genética, mas ele não sabe nunca exatamente porquê. E foi a partir daí que eu comecei a questionar, ok, então e se todos os assolotes fechassem, fechassem os olhos, começassem a desenvolver pálpebras e houvesse um, cruz, um quarto com esta... Um, um quarto, lá está, quase exatamente iconográfico aqui. Uhum, uhum. Um animal cujo olhar é, é, que, que existe, no fundo, como, como objeto de cutificação e de, um, e de mediação online, até, inclusive. Uhum. Boa. E como é que, Paulo, como é que este projeto significa também tanta impermanência como a resistência desta comunidade e de outras comunidades? Bom, quando se fala de um caso como este, que é um caso que até atingiu bastante mediatismo nos últimos tempos, há sempre há uma discussão que anda muito num plano abstrato de, da política, do, das políticas públicas, ou faltas de políticas públicas que resolvam o caso, mas também de alguns atritos entre uh, os proprietários do terreno que foi comprado em asta pública no ano 2000. Uh, entretanto, há um processo que entra em tribunal e que mete a Câmara Municipal do Seixal em, 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 em confronto com, com essa uh, empresa proprietária do terreno, é uma empresa, pelo aquilo que conseguimos pesquisar, que foi constituída num offshore em Gibraltar e chama o Urban Gold, que também talvez nos relembra assim, alguma eventual proveniência de, de, enfim, de todo um mecanismo e fluxo de dinheiro que não se sabe muito bem de onde vem ou para onde vai. Mas isto para dizer que falta haver uma perspectiva mais humana, mais de dentro, mais 
uh, enfim, mais das vozes que, que ali vivem, que, que possam também reivindicar os seus direitos, as suas uh, lutas, as suas experiências e vivências. E, e acho que o aspecto de resistência deste trabalho é esse, é que tenta dar uma perspectiva mais humana a, a este caso uh, e menos abstrato ou nesse plano abstrato. Julgo que foi, foi essa... Uh, é esse o contributo, julgo eu, deste, deste trabalho. Uh, ele também, a nível mais da, da minha prática, como é que, ele, que é uma prática que também passa pelo projeto e a arquitetura leva muito tempo, tem muitos processos também muito burocráticos, mas acho que as exposições são oportunidades também de experimentar rapidamente, ou pelo menos mais rapidamente, do que o mundo uh, burocrático da, da nossa profissão. Uh, então, trazer aqui casos da atualidade, poder trazer, uh, uh, enfim, um caso como o do bairro da Jamaica, que está por definir, não é? Uh, podermos estar em cima do acontecimento e essa atualidade que eu acho que o museu também pode ter um papel muito importante no debate uhum, uhum. Da, daquilo que acontece na sociedade e, e que nos rodeia. Absolutamente. Não, e fazê-lo, e nós estamos agora a ficar sem tempo, vamos passar para a parte das perguntas e respostas, mas fazê-lo de uma forma muito afirmativa e, e, e fazendo exatamente aquilo que talvez estás a dizer, querendo ir para além tanto das questões burocrático políticas e para além do ciclo das notícias, não é? Ou seja, humanizando Sim. também e, e dando outras perspectivas que são muito importantes que serem transmitidas. Não sei como é que é o processo agora de, das perguntas e respostas, não sei de onde é que elas vêm, se vêm online, se vêm daqui. Se alguém tiver alguma pergunta aqui na, na plateia. Braços no ar. Braços no ar. <risos> Está tudo muito tímido. Não sei se entretanto no, no feed há alguma pergunta também. Talvez possa fazer outra pergunta, que depois possa ligar a esta. Se alguém precisar de microfone, pode vir até aqui. Não Sim, sei não este. sei. Bom, uh, farei outra pergunta e depois, se, se surgir, acho que, 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 que falaremos sobre isso. Que tem a ver um pouco... Um, como é que vocês viram a vossa participação e como é que foi a ligação também com os curadores? Ou seja, como é que vocês veem, neste momento, dentro destas das questões, a questão da, da exposição aquária, que é mais específica sobre o mundo do, do, do aquário, como o aquário como dispositivo, e, a, e depois a, a, até a maneira como esta exposição, de uma, de uma forma muito interessante, a meu ver, revela o artifício, sobretudo no filme do Ar, no Armin Link, esta a ideia da impossibilidade da natureza que está composta no aquário, não é? E como é que vocês, e como é que o Paulo, como é que vocês, como é que no teu caso pensas a tua participação numa exposição que fala sobre o pós-global de uma forma, até, diria eu, extremamente local, não é? Sim. Há casos em que tu recebes um convite para participar em alguma coisa e não ficas curioso ou não sabes muito bem como é que isso se, se dá, não é? Pode acontecer essa surpresa. Mas neste caso eu sei exatamente porque é que os curadores me convidaram. Eu fiz um, um trabalho chamado Angola não é um país pequeno já há quase há 10 anos. Foi, foi um mapa que brincava ou, ou, ou enfim, eh, ironizava sobre um mapa muito conhecido de propaganda colonial chamado Portugal não é um país pequeno, onde o território da Europa era sobreposto com as ex-colónias uhum. portuguesas. Isto para mostrar, eh, enfim, a, a grandiosidade do, do Império Português na altura, isto é nos anos 30. Um, e eu, realmente, há 10 anos atrás, fiz uma, uma, um, um jogo com essa... Eu apropriei-me desse mapa com a mesma linguagem, inverti os papéis e coloquei o mapa de Portugal sobreposto no mapa de Angola. Isto para mostrar que, realmente, Angola não é um país pequeno. Na altura, havia, realmente, uma relação muito forte de, de, de migração e, de, enfim, também de, de, de fluxos económicos, mais uma vez, entre os dois países. Um, as, uh, isto também brincando com esta troca de papéis, não é? De, de, do papel do, do antigo colonizador e do antigo colonizado que de alguma forma se invertia. Uh, esse trabalho de alguma forma chegou até aos curadores na sua pesquisa e, e começámos uma conversa sobre não a apresentação do mapa, não é? Que obviamente 
o, o mapa original também lhes interessou porque o, o título da exposição vem daí uhum. uh, mas não uh, trazendo aqui o mapa mas pelo menos alguns conceitos que estavam nessa, nesse, nesse discurso e, e, e nesse, nesse enfim nesse, esse, esse pensamento que estava por trás do, do, da criação desse trabalho podia ser concretizado num caso específico e daí surge depois a conversa que eu já falei há pouco e esta colaboração também que, que enriqueceu certamente todo, todo o processo um, nós daqui a pouco isto julgo que se calhar também podia introduzir o, o tema que é nós, nós vamos nós vamos já a seguir assistir a, ao vídeo que está apresentado dentro de da maquete, é o, o, o vídeo Jamaica, foi, foi um trabalho que o José Sarmento Matos uh, realizou com, 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 com muitos moradores e vários, várias pessoas que, a quem distribuiu câmaras de filmar e, e fez, a, fez uma espécie de, de documentário uh, interativo e, e muito interessante, que depois também mistura música e, e dessa colaboração, isto também é interessante porque o trabalho depois começou a ganhar seus, as suas ramificações, não é? E, e, e criou-se aqui uma relação entre o José e o, e o Kid Robin, que é um, um jovem rapper nascido e, e, e criado na, no bairro da Jamaica, uh, e que a certa altura é desafiado pelo José para pensar em escrever uma música, ou pelo menos pensar se podia falar sobre a sua própria vivência e a sua história individual naquele bairro. E o, o Kid fez um, um, uma música muito muito emocionante, é uma música chamada Perspectiva, onde ele, através da sua história pessoal, acaba por abordar a história uhum. coletiva também, não é? Porque muita gente se revê depois naquela história. Uhum. E, e nós a seguir agora a nossa conversa vamos assistir ao vídeo, portanto ao, ao, ao documentário, com as entrevistas e seguido da, da música e, e daí surge também um convite que o Kid Robin faz ao, ao, ao Sid James, um outro rapper também do bairro da Jamaica. Uh, portanto, depois da música Perspectiva, surgem umas outras uh, três músicas, se não me engano, para, uh, enfim, para celebrar um pouco também aquilo que é uh, a voz e a luta do, do bairro, que acho que estamos muito emocionados claro. com isso. Uh, eu também estou bastante emocionado com o facto de termos presente Uh, não todos os participantes da exposição, mas alguns, dadas as restrições que existem, mas temos hoje aqui a Aurora Cochi, o Asmir Souza, a Manuela Pedro, a Alda Pontes, a Lourdes, Lourdes Pontes, a Telma Reis, a Ana Paulo, o Vítor Pedro, a Joelma Mendes, a Vanusa Cochi e o Marcos Injai, que vieram do bairro da Jamaica ao mate hoje. Já noutros dias vieram outros moradores e participantes no, no projeto, Uh, e, e todo este trabalho tem sido por, uh, também uh, possível porque há um, um, um trabalho muito intenso quer de, desta colaboração do José Sarmento Matos com o seu trabalho documental também o coletivo Chão que se apresenta como coletivo Chão e é muito invisível nesse aspecto mas eu gostava de enumerar a Ana Rita Alves, o António Marcos a Simone Frangela, o Ianis Scuna a Catiana Silva, a Ana Lina Signorello, o Rodrigo Domenech um, e também agradecer a presença do Dr. Manuel Araújo, Presidente da Junta da Mora, que tem sido também muito incansável nesta, neste caso e, e com quem também dá gosto de colaborar e, e enfim, ter esta, esta parceria. E, portanto, vai ser, acho que um momento que também é muito merecido de uhum. poderem de poderem haver aqui uma representação no mate como um espaço muito uh, privilegiado na cidade de Lisboa, sem dúvida uh, e, e, e aí eu abro realmente uma, uma, umas palmas a, aos curadores e à direção aqui do museu porque não é fácil aceitar trazer aqui um caso que é muito controverso e ao mesmo tempo mesmo aqui dentro de casa, porque vocês podem ler na carta dos moradores, na carta aberta Sim. e mesmo na cronologia, Sim. há uma, há uma, enfim, também há uma disputa com a própria EDP e, e, e o bairro e, enfim, tudo isto é, acaba por ser uma oportunidade realmente única e fantástica de podermos trazer o nosso cavalo de Troia aqui para uhum. dentro do mate uhum. e, e deixar esta 
a estas mensagens. Acho que isso é uma belíssima forma de nós passarmos, se me permites, Alice, se passarmos para a próxima parte do, do programa de hoje. Uh, não sei se deveremos chamar a Beatriz ou se passamos diretamente. Passamos diretamente. Ótimo. Um, então, muito obrigado. Acho que temos que sair, não é? Temos que dar lugar. Muito obrigado, Alice. Muito obrigado, Paulo. Muito obrigado ao Mato também, à Beatriz, por este convite. Uh, venham ao Mato, venham ver as posições e continuem a ver o, também o, o site, o Mato Extended. Não se esqueçam, fim de junho, o, os dias do, do, da Jamaica, não é? Aqui no museu. Um, portanto, obrigado outra vez e o resto um bom programa. Quando chegamos aqui, mal saí do aeroporto, achei Portugal lindíssimo, que a gente sonhava tanto com esta terra, mas entretanto é, pusemos-nos no táxi e, e quando saímos na margem sul, viemos ter o fogueteiro, havia os prédios bonitos, atravessamos os prédios bonitos, depois chegamos a uma zona que eu pensei que a gente tinha voltado para a África. A Jamaica é parecida com os bairros lá do Prenda, prédios inacabados, tijoleira, Mosquitos, baratas, ratos, vala, valas, lama, tudo, everything, teto, casa, não há luz, hum, nem todas as casas na altura tinham água canalizada. Porque nós precisamos de muita ajuda aqui. Precisamos de muita ajuda em muitos aspectos. Em muitos aspectos. Principalmente é preocupado com aspectos sociais e ajuda para desenvolver a nossa capacidade, porque nós todos, quase 97% ou 99%, quer sair daqui do bairro. Quer receber uma habitação condigna. Nós não devemos ser afastados, não devemos ser abandonados. Porque isso é muito importante para a sociedade. E tenho que dizer que já estamos no século XXI. Devemos mudar as nossas mentalidades. Todo, todos os portugueses, todo Portugal, devem saber que o bairro existe. As pessoas humanas existem. Todos nós somos iguais. Todos nós temos que ser controlados a nível nacional. Controlados em termos, em termos de saúde, em termos de segurança, em, em todos os termos. Ai, com os miúdos em casa, tipo, nós passamos de mãe para os professores, né? Toda a gente que tem filho foi muito complicado, muito estressante. Não estava a gravar esse tempo todo? Mentira, estava. Não, Paulo. A minha filha está mesmo gira. Acabamos de água quente. Já pus o cabelo que a minha cunhada trançou. Nela. Ai. Que vai... Vai avançar. Agora esta quarentena vai ser muito chata. Nossa querida Mariazinha. Só trabalhar no computador. E coisa. E a mãe ela está preparada, tem que estudar, fazer as tarefas e estudar. E tem que ter teste. Não, quando chegar. Eu já Agora vou ter que estudar. Está excelente. Graças a Deus, é uma benção estudar. É um foi uma batalha muito grande. Eu fiquei quatro anos à espera da resposta do CEF, quatro anos, esses quatro anos não foi fácil. E então, quando ela abre o livro grande, fala assim, é a Alda Batista Sousa Pontesou. E ela disse, tu já tem nacionalidade, olha. Eu disse à senhora, eu só disse à senhora, eu rezei no momento, e disse à senhora, muito obrigada, a senhora não sabe a satisfação que a senhora está me dando agora. Eu estou muito, muito satisfeita. 
E a senhora ficou assim, tipo, <risos> não estava a acreditar que coisa, não tinha noção daquilo que estava a passar dentro de mim. E em casa eles não aprendem muito. Eles tinham aulas, um, eles tinham aula, tipo, aquela aula que eles têm que ver na televisão, mas aquilo não era nada, porque, tipo, se a pessoa tivesse uma dúvida, não tinha como tirar dúvida. Um, se eles tinham, não sabiam como resolver um exercício, não tinham como pedir ajuda ao professor. Eu sou péssima em matemática, então não, também não consegui ajudar nesse aspecto. Um, tipo, inglês, ciência, história, essas disciplinas mais práticas, sim, agora. Matemática é uma coisa de qual eu sou boa, e, foi, e durante a, um, a quarentena a gente teve aí durante um bom tempo um pouco assim, a rascas, tanto que depois tive que pedir ajuda a um amigo meu. Quando vi aquela conversa aqui, no inverno é muito pior, porque o vírus desenvolve mais rapidamente, nananã. Eu fiquei preocupada porque, não por mim, mas pelos meus filhos. Pelos meus filhos, porque as condições não são boas, a casa é fria, ah, e sim, quando chove, entra a chuva cá dentro. Mas também eu não. Do mesmo, jeito que eu, do, meu, do mesmo tempo, da mesma altura que eu estava preocupada, eu também estava aliviada, porque eu tinha um aquecedor, então obrigava meus filhos a ficarem debaixo do aquecedor. Fiquei muito preocupada. Se alguém apanhasse Covid, né? como é que a gente ia... <risos> ia ficar em termos de espaço? Né? Naquela altura mandaram fechar o restaurante e desde aquela altura de pandemia eu fiquei em casa. E pronto, eu vi que não aparecia outro andeiro, o dia e procurava, todo mundo a dizer sempre a mesma coisa, e papai de mim está não sei o quê, agora isso está fraco, não pode fazer mais nada, não sei o quê. Eu disse, opa, eu vou para a obra. Na quarta-feira vai estar aí parada às seis horas, que eu sei que está aí seis horas de si. Então fiquei pronta às seis horas, que é para pegar aí pra, com todo o grupo que é para ir para o trabalho. É chato, é chato viver aqui, é chato ter filhos aqui. Nem tem problema. Porque tens aqui esse espaço fixe. Sim. Todas as pessoas que vivem aqui estão abrangidas no plano de realojamento da Câmara. Este plano que eu já o conheço há 20 anos, né? Eu estou cá há 20 anos e já eu sou falar deste plano há 20 anos. E antes de eu cá estar, eu só ouvia falar deste plano. Tem uns. Deixa-me ver. Um, dois, três, quatro, cinco, seis blocos. Eles realojaram um bloco porque também. Aquele bloco estava debilitado, né? estava em condições deploráveis, a qualquer momento podia cair. Teve cá o primeiro-ministro e na altura falou-se muito que logo a seguir iam realojar o resto do pessoal. Isto já há dois anos e ainda cá estamos, né? porque vamos daqui a pouco é dezembro e faz dois anos que eles saíram daqui, acho que foi no dia 18 ou 19, não me recordo bem da data. O bebezinho vai nascer, vai andar por aqui e a gente ainda cá está, cá estará. As pessoas têm noção que as pessoas que vivem aqui, tipo, a maioria das pessoas não trabalha, mas é mentira, porque a maioria das pessoas aqui acorda muitas vezes 5 da manhã, a maioria das pessoas aqui trabalha mesmo às 5 da manhã e vai...
estamos e pelos vistos não há previsão de sairmos daqui tão cedo a câmara não diz que não nos realoja mas não, não tem uma data definida para, para fazer isto portanto eu sinto que no fundo ninguém quer saber como é que a gente está a viver Digo aos manos, eles não estão do nosso lado Só querem vir aqui tirar umas fotos Postar na net e fingir que estão do nosso lado Nossos cotas habituados a serem oprimidos e ignorados E é nessas ruas que percebes os maiores bandidos estão engravatados Muitos deles com mestrados, eles e os bofas são aliados Também trabalham em crime organizado Enquanto vas ouvindo eu vou te perguntando O niga tinha 30 capas mas só 25 é que foram encontrados E na guita também faltam um bom bocado O hum, que é que tu achas disso? Se não acreditas vem para aqui Eu vou te mostrar um bocado disso Sinceramente eu não quero ver o bairro a se destruir Mas se peço um lugar com melhores condições não é por mim É pelos cotas eles estão a ficar velhos e infelizmente aqui Estão mais postos a problemas de saúde Eles perguntam não há ninguém que nos ajude Saem da África com esperança de construir uma nova vida Mas muitos enterram a esperança antes dessa nova vida Milda tem dois filhos para criar e só tem 19 tudo já tá pronto para tirar antes dos 19 Niga eu conheci fome e drama antes do Covid-19 Trago todo o sol das cotas da limpeza que tu desprezavas Todo o mau cheiro dos cotas das obras que no autocarro detestavas Sem vergonha do que eu sou, sou um livro aberto Vou-te abrir as portas da minha casa, senta tu meu nome é Roberto Vou-te abrir as portas do meu bairro, esquece o que já ouviste no noticiário Bairro da Jamaica, não vem no dicionário Presta atenção que eu falo, em cima do beat do cesário Ei, trazemos a cor do pecado, farto ouvir volta para tua terra Como se a culpa não fosse deles por nos terem colonizado Por nos terem violado, por nos terem roubado E cá estamos nós abandonados pelo Estado Mas eu já não tenho reclamado, porque isso não nos leva a nenhum lado Tudo é uma questão de perspectiva, entendo que não percebas a nossa vida Tudo é uma questão de perspectiva, eu entendo que não percebas a nossa vida Obrigado, obrigado. É minha mãe. Calma, segura, segura. Está todo de coisa da reputação. Não sei, aprendo. Bem, para quem não me conhece, eu chamo-me Kid, Kid Robin. Uh, sou do bairro da Jamaica, como deu para perceber. E trouxe-vos aqui a música Perspectiva, que eu fiz especialmente para esse projeto uh, do Zé, que ele convidou-me. E pronto, espero que tenham gostado. E agora eu vou apresentar mais três músicas com o meu companheiro de longa data, Cicinho James. Uh, a música que vamos apresentar fizemos em 2017. E por acaso foi uma música que fizemos depois de saber que iam mandar abaixo os prédios e a letra também tem muito a ver com esta situação meu mano yeah, aí é uh -huh. Kid Robin Jamaica Gueto vida de rua, vida de gueto só quem vive é que percebe Anta vive na gueto vive na gueto não te vive na guerra, quero, 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 vive na guerra, vive na guerra, não te vive na guerra, quero, quero, quero. Na luta e no raço todos os dias, 
eu mato-me todos os dias Não vês, mas eu trabalho todos os dias Amasso todos os dias, já nem durmo bem aos dias Mesmo assim, uns insistem em estragar os meus dias Só eu sei, a dor que eu senti quando eu vi Que eu mandar abaixo o bairro onde eu cresci Vivi e aprendi Será este o fim? Eu também não sei, mas se puder escolher Passava por tudo que já passei Nas cenas que acertei Também nas que falei Não me arrependo de nenhuma atitude que tomei Graças ao meu gueto Vejo no homem que me tornei Graças às ruas Vejo no homem que me tornei Agora vamos apresentar uma música que ainda não saiu, está para sair, faz parte do nosso grupo e chama-se Bairro. E é mais ou menos assim. Estou passado do meu bairro. Quando eu cresci, onde aprendi a ser homem e levo sempre para onde eu for. Agradeço a ele por hoje ser o que sou. Yeah. Yeah. Pausado no bairro com os negas, traz as tuas amigas Aqui não faz suas músicas e bebidas Aqui só entra as situações em dia positiva Pus e nega, a vossa presença não é bem-vinda Minha casa mais que coisa tão linda Longe ou perto a família tá sempre unida Um abraço pra palanca, meu real nigga Qualquer mambo sabe se é só ligar Ei, Quem já cá teve, tem saudades e quer voltar Quem tem raiva bebe veneno e pode se envenenar Da like a mãe dos anjos, do conta a mãos nos manos Dos chantolas aos angolanos, dos dinheiros são poucos brilhantes de anos. Obrigado Jamaica por me fazer chunhar E para aqueles que estão a tentar difamar Nós ainda não vamos calar Tô pausado no meu bairro oh, oh, oh. Sei de onde vim, não sei onde vou Tô com a minha fé, então let's go Aqui não importa raças, muito menos cor Sonhamos com tudo mesmo sem ter nada Mas se eu quero é porque eu mereço Levar todos os manos ao topo Eu confesso, não ser mandado Nunca não tem preço Aqui é dormir para sonhar Depois acordar e analisar E não é nada fácil, sei bro Mas vamos morrer a tentar Aqui é dormir para sonhar depois acordar e realizar E não é nada fácil, sei bro Mas vamos morrer a tentar Tô pausado no meu bairro Tô pausado no meu bairro Tô pausado no meu bairro quando eu cresci, onde aprendi a ser homem e levo sempre para onde eu for. Agradeço a ele por hoje ser o que sou. Yeah. Tô pausado no meu pai. Onde eu cresci, onde aprendi a ser homem e levo sempre para onde eu for. Agradeço a ele por hoje ser o que sou. Yeah. Obrigado, Jamaica. E agora, agora, agora a última música, uh, chama-se Longe, a nossa primeira música que atingiu 100 mil visualizações no YouTube. E desde já, obrigado a todos, a quem acompanha e quem tem acompanhado. DJ. Meu mano, eu tô longe. Agora só me fez dos binóculos Tá me escuta mais o que é mais um coxa Problemas na vida me deram mais forte Meu mano tô longe Agora só me fez dos binóculos Tá me escuta mais o que é mais um coxa Problemas na vida me deram mais forte Meu mano tô longe Meu mano vai me ver vais precisar de bomba mais Porque eu e os meus niggas já demos gás Tá me a deixar todos os rappers para trás Tenta se tu te sentes capaz São tantos flores estou a pensar em fazer um cabaz Meu da sua foda teu big buri Comer rappers é o que me satisfaz E pra cuia mais Ainda nem vou a meio Já percebeste do que é que eu sou capaz Ei, Bolívia é gang I just wanna do my thing yeah. Nigga não vem que não tem Melhor do que eu nessa cena não há ninguém yeah. Tô tipo Zatan Me confio e não dou confiança a ninguém yeah. Filho do guerra avisa que eu não quero novas amizades Mano eu vim fazer dinheiro Dólares, libras, euros Foda com o bupo de vida do mundo inteiro Tô longe, a 
atrás dos milhões E eu nem falo de visualizações Bem niggas na beca, Jamaica no topo No ETA, mais caro da zona sou camões Yo. Yo. Niggas questionam talento Chego no estúdio e escrevo no momento Às vezes salto o mic e deixo lento Só vês vulto, não te deixo ver movimentos Yo, rappers da zona Respeitam o papá E hoje, essas barras Miudinhos vão reirar Se foda, os niggas Estão a comandar Ué, euros no meu corpo Já tem gente a querer me comprar Yo, nigga, tô longe Tá avisei ontem, mas só viste hoje Tá me batendo no beat tipo é funge Luxo é o fio que tenho porque eu posso Lixo é o som que tu lanças, não ouço Bicho, sou eu que no teu pescoço Eu sei que tu vês que isso é tudo nosso, nigga Big gang Eu sei que tu vês que isso é tudo nosso, nigga Agora sou muito vez de binóculos Estamos escudo e mais o que? Mais um coche Problemas na vida meteram mais forte Meu mano, eu tô longe Agora sou muito vez de binóculos Estamos escudo e mais o que? Mais um coche Problemas na vida meteram mais forte Meu mano, eu tô longe 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 já. Oi. Obrigado, obrigado. Mais uma vez, eu sou o Kid Robin. Eu sou o Cicin James. E obrigado a todos que estão aqui presentes. Muito obrigado ao Museu Amado por ter abraçado o projeto, por ter nos dado essa oportunidade de estar aqui. Obrigado aos meus manos todos que estão aqui. Cesário, Wayne, Tati, Hugo, Texas, meu irmão, meus pais. Toda a gente está aqui, muito obrigado. Nós somos a Big Gang e quem quiser saber mais, já vamos nos encontrar. Quem está aí em casa também, muito obrigado. E até a próxima. All right, obrigada. Really, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful day. I thank everyone for taking part, for you here, for people that have been following us online. Anyway, this is gonna be recorded, so we hope that you know, more, we'll have a chance to see what's happened today. But uh, please follow us, follow Matt, because in the coming months, until uh, the first week of September, when the exhibition will close, we are uh, organizing a wealth of uh, public programs, educational projects, ways for you to learn more, understand more of, of this wonderful project, projects and explorations in our current times. So make sure to follow you know, us on socials, on, you know, check our website, and of course, Matt Extended. So thank you everyone again for taking part, and when I'll see you soon at Matt. Bye.